Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Gilligan Rose uh, election update. Thank you for joining Tony Alexander and myself, Matthew Gilligan, this evening for what should be an interesting discussion on uh, the property market as it sits in 2017 and what's happening with Labour and what's happening with the economy generally. Very interesting times we're in. Uh, firstly, welcome Tony. Thank you for joining me this evening. Thanks, Matt. A uh, little bit about me, if you don't know me, I'm a Chartered Accountant, I specialise in property, I'm Managing Partner here at GRA, and many of you will be aware that uh, I'm a property investor myself, having had a background in tax in the past, and I'm, I'm uh, getting along in the tooth and very much enjoy working with clients, helping them build their portfolios and make money out of the knowledge we have here at GRA. Also got a couple of books, Property 101 and Tax Structures 101. Uh, Tony Alexander, a name that everybody knows is BNZ's Chief Economist, and I'll give him a more thorough presentation, uh, but he has a, a very good pedigree <coughs> as BNZ's Chief Economist since 1994, uh, over 23 years at the BNZ helm in this role. Uh, he's a, an excellent public speaker, uh, he's a bank advisor, he's an entertainer, and a thoroughly interesting man to listen to. So uh, we look forward to listening to him this evening. The agenda will be, firstly, I'm going to give a quick election and market update. And if you like, I'm taking the micro picture, the data on what's happening. Uh, then Tony's going to give the macro picture and an economic review and talk to the Labor policies, which are the coalition policies which are coming out. And then I'll, I will come back and talk about investor strategies that I think are relevant in this environment. So that's the lineup for this evening. So me first, then Tony, then me again. Now I thought we might try and run a poll, and I'm a bit of a technophobe, but we've introduced ourselves to you. We'd very much like you to give us a little bit of uh, information on yourselves. So if you could uh, start by answering this poll, which should be on the screen now. Uh, and that is, tell us how many investment properties you have. I'm sorry, this poll is gonna be, yeah. Have you got that, does that come up online? No, wait, I've got a press a button here. There we go. So if you could just tell us how many investment properties you've got and I'll answer the question too. Everybody click the button. Just waiting quietly there. And the other question we're going to ask you is to what extent you guys rely on negative gearing? Because of course, uh, something Tony and I are both interested in is with these loss limitation rules or, or loss ring fencing rules coming in. Just how much does the market rely on uh, negative gearing? Uh, the ability to take negatively geared losses and claim tax on them. So that's the second poll we're going to throw at you this evening. So this poll, I'll just leave it open for another five seconds. Looks like you're mostly there now. So 66% of you own between one to five. 16% uh, own none. 12% have six to 10 properties, 5% have five to 11 properties, and 3% have, uh, sorry, 5% of you have 11 to 20 properties, and 3% have 21 plus properties. So quite interesting. Most of you own one to five properties. Okay, well, uh, that's our first poll of the evening. Thank you for uh, sharing that with us. The other two polls will be to what extent the negative gear, and if we can get the election result up, we'll do that as well. Okay, what's happened in 2017? Well, <clears throat> I saw, I've seen eight uh, quite key things happening. Firstly, a general slowdown, which is, for many of these reasons, uh, starting primarily with a cyclical peak. If you go back across the former peaks, they were 87, 97, 2007, they're running in 10 year cycles. So here we are, 2017, uh, we have a lack of affordability, which is something you see at the top of a, of a property cycle. 
and things get expensive, people realise they get expensive, they perceive that there's less value in the market, that there's less uh, ability for capital gains to emerge, and that lack of affordability coupled with the perception that the market's peaking out causes everybody to stop. So, and I think it was a very predicted stop. If you read my book in, that I wrote in 2013, I said it'll stop in 2017, all things being equal. Uh, I've listened to Tony across the years and he, he also sees these uh, peaks in the seven years happening. Uh, so, yeah, a lack of affordability and a slowdown in the market uh, was, I think, well predicted. In fact, it peaked last year in 2016, was uh, the, the peaking of values in Auckland, and in 17, we've just seen a reduction of volumes and activity. <clears throat> Part of this has been the uh, finance industry tightening up, starting in Australia with uh, APRA uh, changing the capital adequacy ratios and the amount of cash that a bank has to carry to lend the same amount of money. Of course, we've also had the development finance meltdown in Australia uh, starting last year and coming into this year, which, if you're not aware, has been very much driven by uh, the Australian banks relying on foreign buyer finance on the retail side of their banks. So the development finance arms have lent the money. The retail side has then withdrawn foreign buyer finance, particularly, well, to all foreigners, but it's particularly relevant to the plethora of Chinese who bought all of the Australian apartments and suddenly there's been a withdrawal of retail finance for foreign buyers. There's no foreign buyer lending in Australia and that's come to New Zealand later. So that's, there's a meltdown in the availability of development finance as a result of that. And that's an Australian story but it's spread to New Zealand because all of the Australian subsidiary banks are unable <coughs> to get the development finance out of Australia. Uh, of course, in New Zealand, where the Reserve Bank, following the GFC uh, risk uh, and analysis of the New Zealand market, looked at what happened uh, and said, well, the, if the Australian banks dis were, had pressure on them, they could wind up the New Zealand subsidiaries, take the deposit holders' money, because the way they've structured the, the New Zealand subsidiaries uh, their advances to them, which counted as capital for capital adequacy tests, uh, were actually ranking ahead of New Zealand deposit holders' money. So the Reserve Bank saw this and said, well, that's not cricket, and changed the rules to say that uh, the Australian banks needed to properly capitalise the banks as uh, an independent bank in New Zealand rather than operating as a branch and treating uh, advances from Australia as capital. Um, when in fact it was money that they could pull out of New Zealand deposit holders' money. I hope that makes sense. So the Reserve Banks uh, followed suit and said New Zealand banks must carry more cash. They can't count these shareholder loans from their parent banks as equity. They've got to properly capitalise the banks and protect the local deposit holders. So all of this has led to a withdrawal of finance. And the cherry on top that everybody looks at has been the LVR story, another Reserve Bank initiative starting at 20% deposits, moving to 30%, uh, up to 40% in more recent times. But the LVR story, I think, I think is the cherry on top. Actually, the general tightening of the, uh, the banking environment from Australia and New Zealand is, is the real picture that's, that's playing out. It's not so much the Reserve Bank uh, changing the LVR rules that has caused the damage. <clears throat> DDI fears came in, and of course, uh, I don't know if you watched this earlier in the year, but the debt-to-income ratios really scared me as an investor. If you borrowed $2 million for investment and DTI, DTIs came in, you would have needed to have 5 to 1. You would have needed a $400,000 income to satisfy debt-to-income ratios at, at uh, 5 to 1. So most investors wouldn't have that income level. There were big question marks over whether, uh, you know, there'd be any growth if they bought DTIs and under, the, under such conditions, and many investors were quite fearful of that. We had the Osaki case this year, which was the tenancy tribunal case where a tenant uh, caused harm and liability to their premises, uh, to, to a landlord's uh, uh, residential property, and the tenancy tribunal said that if the uh, landlord had insurance, that the landlord must claim insurance before you could claim against the tenant, which 
from natural justice perspective, I think many people objected to that and it scared the hell out of us as, as landlords. P contamination has been a big issue that's played out in the media this year with uh, testing ratios going from 0.5 being the legal limit to 1.5, which I think is a bit more rational. I think the market's now realising that P contamination is not the end of the earth uh, and it's pretty cheap to fix if you know how to fix it and as long as you get the right people involved. Investor bashing has been a big uh, deal that has emerged. I think the green-eyed monster has crept into election, electioneering and just generally there's a, a sentiment that investors are you know, making more money out of their houses than they do out of their jobs and you see this in the, the media every day of the week and that green-eyed monster is starting to play out in politics with an appetite to tax investors and to make investing uh, less attractive, but you know when you go back in past cycles, I think that's a, a seven year, uh, as in 2007 year, 2017 year type thing where every time you get to a seven year the green eyed monster comes out, all the investors are making the money and uh, you start seeing the green eyed monster. But that will go away once the market becomes recessionary and uh, it will revert to the patterns of the past in my opinion. And, and of course on top of all of this, it's an election year which creates election fear. Uh, what would a new government, a uh, left-wing go government do? Oh my goodness, what happened? What would happen if Labor actually got in? <laughs> you know, it was the fear all year and very much uh, that's upon us now. So let's talk about that election market update. What I want to do is just race through Labor's policies and then having done that, do some data, look at, look at what's actually going on here to date. And then with that as a backdrop, uh, hand over to Tony and Tony can run through the macro view. So Labor, and when I speak of Labor, I speak of the coalition of course, but uh, I'll give Labor's stand to it. Of course they've, they've followed through with the election promise and said uh, foreign house buyers uh, are no longer allowed to purchase second-hand houses, they can only purchase new houses. <clears throat> this is Australian policy. That they've imported from Australia. It's not new. They've also said that farms over five hectares will be restricted uh, much more so than in the past. And a question I have for Tony is how are they going to do this with TPP conflict and an amendment required? In fact, Tony, how about you coming in right now? Because how do you square that with the TPP? Yeah, well, if it's uh, explicitly sort of prohibited in the T in TPP or some other trade agreements, they're going to have to renegotiate the uh, the agreements, and I guess that's what uh, the Prime Minister will be taken to APEC when she hops across there uh, fairly soon. Um, and so you're seeing uh, if agreements do need to be changed. So, you know, legislatively, um, there'll have to be some tweaking involved. It's common overseas to prevent foreigners from buying your uh, your, your property, housing, farms, um, etc. So in a way, um, it'll look pretty logical, I think, to most of the other treaty partners. It's a question of whether they take the opportunity to try and get something else in return, because mm. we were, uh, in their opinion, uh, stupid enough to, not to include it um, in the start. So they can't just say, right, that's the rule and it's effective tomorrow. It, it could take some time. Yeah, the other thing is apparently there's a lot of foreign-owned corporates that would be affected uh, by this o OIA permission being required for farming and so forth. Well, um, certainly for new pur new purchases, you would think, for their existing yeah. holdings, you, know, you wouldn't expect any touching yeah. um, of, of that. Yeah. So immigration, we're going to see uh, apparently net migration cut by 30,000 people, 10,000 houses uh, at one house per three people. Uh, there's a focus on low quality student migration in this, uh, and from that I think we'll see the Auckland CBD get bashed if they start pulling the students out of, out of the market. So if I was an apartment owner, or somebody with lots of apartments in the CBD, I'd be re very concerned about that trend because that's your market drying up right there, a withdrawal of demand. Um, who's going to build the country and run the public service is a question I have about this. The policy is not as simple as it sounds. I mean, it's a, it's a nice policy, like all of these Labor policies, um, possibly a bit utopian because, you know, we if we slash the net migration by 30,000 people, if you break net migration down, uh, it, there's 120,000 coming in, 50,000 going out, net of 70, but of the people coming in, up to half of them are actually expats. So what are you actually cutting, you know, when you cut 30,000 people out? There's only 60,000 coming in that are not expats, so you're slashing net migration by 50%. Uh, 
that's a big ask. And it must be very recessionary in every respect that this is implemented for property. It's 10,000 houses a year not needed. So that, that will be uh, that will be interesting. Having said that, uh, maybe it's needed. I mean, the market is just too hot. And um, although it's been cur curtailed with a reduction of uh, finance availability, it uh, probably is time for a breather. So as long as it's not a permanent thing, I, I don't think it's a terrible thing. Uh, on landlords, the uh, Healthy Homes Guarantee Bills before Parliament and Labor intend to beef this up. They're going to provide $2,000 grants to help pay for the upgrades that they require, but insula insulation and warmth rules are going to be uh, much stronger than they have been in the past. There's also going to be more robust rules surrounding the right to terminate tenants. We're moving from 42-day notices to 90-day notices. Uh, they're uh, abolishing no, no cause terminations, so if, you, if your tenants annoy you and you kick them out, uh, you can't do that anymore, you have to have a, a cause that's going to be uh, set out in statute as to what can and can't be a, a, a lawful termination of contract. Uh, they are retaining the right of the landlord to remove tenant, tenants in breach of agreements with 90 days notice or faster with tribunal order. Uh, they're limiting the rental increase to one per year. You can, at the moment, you can do one every six months, but they're going to limit it to one rental increase per year, and they're banning letting fees. So all, I don't want to call it um, investor bashing, but it's, it's a, uh, certainly a tougher environment. On business, they're increasing the uh, minimum wage to $16.50 per hour. Uh, I think it's coming in in April next year, and their goal is to move that to $20 an hour over three years to 2020. Nice idea, but uh, you'd have to ask for it to stalk the employment market and be inflationary. And there's lots of small business out there that doesn't make $20 an hour. What are they going to do? You know, Close uh, down. Close down, yeah. So if, you know, if I had the choice of uh, employing a student and teaching them and versus, say, at, at the current minimum wage, Maybe I pay them fifteen bucks an hour or something. What is the current minimum wage? Uh, fifteen dollars seventy-five. Fifteen seventy-five. Uh, if I had the choice of doing that versus being forced to pay them twenty dollars an hour, well, I'm probably going to go for an adult, which will cut a whole bunch of young people off from getting opportunity. One would think. Yeah. Uh, and so, of course, that leads to well, if wages are so expensive, we have to put the prices up. So, do we have wage price spirals, which was. Uh, Muldoon thing, wasn't mm. it? Yeah, I'm not old enough to remember that sort of thing, so I'll defer to you, Tony. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, the Reserve Bank reform, again, something that Tony will probably be able to tell us more about, but there's now going to be Reserve Bank Governor appointment input from central government. They can approve the Reserve Bank Governor. Oh, that's always been the case. It's the committee structure for determining the cash rate changes. Right. It's sort of the, the bigger change. Uh, focus on full employment and a committee decides uh, cash rate changes. That's the main bit. Okay. And so they're going to have representation on that committee, is that what they want? Or uh, they just no, no political people? representation, but there will be external advisors on that committee, you know, maybe major industry uh, sort of representative or something like that. It's common overseas. Okay. And they're broadening the focus to include employment rather than just the primary focus on inflation, 1% to 3%? Again, common overseas. Yeah. It won't make really, I'd say, any difference to policy implementation in New Zealand. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I think it's too conservative anyway, the way it is. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, look, as I say, overseas, uh, we've yeah. always had to take time to explain New Zealand monetary policy to people overseas. They haven't got it. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Let's talk tax for a minute. Uh, so for immediate implementation, they're looking at the five-year bright line rules, uh, which will be relatively easy for them. Be aware that this is, although there's no detail on any of this policy, if you read through all of their rhetoric and the bits and pieces they've published, I have said in uh, some of the electioneering that these rules are likely to be grandfathered rules, so that means that they'll come in and apply to properties after acquired after X date. So, for example, they might say uh, the five-year bright line rules will apply to properties acquired after the 1st of April 2018. Uh, I don't expect these rules to come in retrospectively on existing assets owned, so that might give some people comfort. Uh, but I will repeat that this is that obviously we can't be firm until Labor uh, publish their policy. But these grandfathering rules are expected. And of course, five year bright line rules are just an extension of the existing two year rules, which uh, deem an intention to sell 
if you sell within two years of acquisition, family homes being exempt, and this is residential property. The second thing they're doing is ring fencing property losses. I think this will be the biggest hit to investors out of this government so far that they've published. Uh, they're saying they're going to ring fence property losses to income derived from property. Uh, so in other words, if you uh, pay $50,000 of interest and operating expenses and you receive $30,000 of rent, you're minus $20,000. At the moment, you could claim tax of your marginal tax rate on that. If you're at 33%, that would be in the vicinity of $17,000 as a tax refund. Uh, Labor are going to stop that, and you won't be able to claim uh, tax relief on that $50,000 loss. Uh, but they say they're going to phase it in over five years, and uh, that's fine. But what I would say is there's a natural valve that comes out of losses being claimable. Uh, it's a pressure valve that takes some of the pressure off the property economy when interest rates rise. So if interest rates rise 1% and you owe a million dollars uh, on your investment property, that 1% increase is $10,000. And if you only have to pay two thirds of that because you can claim tax at 33% off that, then the government writes you a cheque for 3,300, you pay 6,700 of the interest. And that takes some of the sting out of a hike in interest rates. And what Labor are doing by removing the ability to uh, claim those losses progressively over the next five years, I think, is they're going to increase the volatility of the next recession driven by a hike in interest rates. Because that lack of ability to get tax refunds is going to bite those that are most needy and uh, that are carrying the most debt. So I think that's going to increase the volatility of property, and I don't look forward to, to seeing that. Uh, the next thing that they've done from a tax perspective is they're cancelling the tax rate decreases, which I think is, uh, of course, National tried to say that was an increase in tax rates by not. <laughs> yeah, the legislation was passed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah but they've yeah, just, just held them where they are. So uh, moving on, uh, for the next election cycle, they've said that they'll be looking at capital gains tax. And they're going to have a tax working group that they will convene. It's going to be the next election cycle. Uh, we don't know if it's a full capital gains tax that applies to everything or whether it's just simply a, a capital gains tax relating to property. To me, it wouldn't make sense with Brightline rules to bring a capital gains tax in that is essentially capturing most of those sales of property, certainly in the short term, if you've got five-year bright line rules. And if they just want to tax property, why wouldn't they make them 10-year bright line rules or 15-year bright line rules? Easier way to go. Yeah, it'd be a much simpler way to do it. So if they're talking capital gains tax, must be comprehensive capital gains tax, tax everything, tax increases in the value of your art, your chattels, your businesses, your share portfolios, as well as property. And when you start to get into uh, something as structurally uh, deep and technical is bringing a capital gains tax in, it's a very complicated thing indeed. It will require years of consultation uh, with the public and publication of what they want to do. And uh, Labor have been good enough, especially once they got a bit of uh, election uh, pressure from National and they labelled her tax under and so forth in the papers, uh, that she was good enough to say, well, we won't bring capital gains tax in. This cycle will publish exactly what it is that the uh, tax committee is going to come up with is the fairer system and then let New Zealand re-elect Labour if they agree with them. So that's for the next election cycle. We don't have to worry about CGT this cycle. One thing that I do want to flag is that I'm not aware of any OECD country that has brought capital gains tax in and, and not brought stamp duty in, in parallel with it. Uh, maybe there are some exceptions to this rule, but generally you have a capital gains tax, you have a stamp duty. And I'll define more what stamp duty is in a few minutes, but it's a tax that purchases pay on acquisition of a property. And uh, that, I think, is a mole uh, that is hidden in this discussion. I, th I could see stamp duty coming in New Zealand. Uh, and that will be a very tough thing for property investors to swallow. When you look at CGT issues, uh, a couple of things. You get lock-in effect. People don't sell because if they sell, they have to pay the tax. So let's say you've got a capital gain of a million dollars on a building you've owned for 20 years. It's actually more cost effective to just 
raise finance against the million dollar gain and extract that cash out using finance and keep the property than it is to sell the property and pay the tax. In fact, you'll probably get as much or most of what you would have got if you uh, sold and paid tax as if you just gear up the capital gain with a banker. So this lock-in effect means people don't sell and it's something that frustrates the market overseas. You also, with capital gains tax, get a mansion effect because family homes are generally exempt under capital gains tax. So you end up with uh, family homes becoming very valuable and uh, and that's driven by the CGT itself exempting family homes. It distorts the behaviour of people they want uh, property, uh, family homes in their property portfolio. And they push the values of them higher and higher uh, just simply because of the tax exemption. So CGT doesn't contain house price inflation overseas. Overseas countries like Australia and Canada that have capital gains tax uh, have been very inflationary with their house prices. So it's not a, a measure to try and contain house prices at all, it's just purely about revenue raising. And as I said, CGT goes hand in hand with stamp duty, so it will be a tough thing to swallow. It's not possible to do any planning for CGT in New Zealand until we see the shape of the legislation, and that's years away. Uh, is it just property? Is it all assets? What we did get was prior to the last election, a bit of discussion on this, and they talked about V-Day or Valuation Day, and all gains after V-Day would be taxable, so it became very important that everybody got a valuation as high as they possibly could before the tax was going to apply. And that will definitely be the case if we uh, get CGT in the future. Uh, indeed, avoidance will rear its head here, because if, for example, Tony had a building worth a million dollars and I had a building worth a million dollars, uh, they are both investment properties, and we decided to buy them off each other for 1.5 million. We're both in the same cash position. If we then sell the properties, uh, we have a $500,000 loss. We're not related parties. Uh, we make a $500,000 loss. That sort of thing is rife overseas, huh. rears its head, and uh, people game the system to to try and manufacture losses. So it's quite uh, something that a whole new layer of problems for the IRD to manage if they bring CGT in. Alternative tax options uh, that we'll see from the proposed tax working group. I think land tax is an obvious one that they'll look at. Uh, typically it's an annual tax on your land holdings, the value of your land holdings at a specified date. In Australia it's 31 December. Uh, in New Zealand they might pick uh, 31 March each year for example. And they just tax your percentage of the land holdings that you hold. So if you have a million dollars worth of property, they might tax you 0.25%, so you get uh, $2,500 as a tax bill for the pleasure of owning those properties that year. And these land taxes can be progressive rates on the volume held, like in Australia, if you hold more than two and a half million in Victoria, uh, then the land tax rate goes up. And so what this does is it reduces property values immediately when you bring it in, and redistributes wealth because uh, you know if your cash return on a property is five percent and suddenly you have to pay uh, ten percent of that five percent away to land tax if it was 0.5 percent then the cash returns have dropped ten percent so the value of your property will drop by some proportion of that possibly ten percent so land tax is something that's quite deflationary and you want to keep your eye on that if this uh, tax committee proposes such reform and the last time we had a tax group uh, look at this, they did propose a land tax and recommend it. Uh, stamp duty, as I mentioned, taxes the purchaser. Typically, it's sort of three to six percent in Australia. Five to six percent is a typical number. Uh, the purchaser pays it. You can't borrow against it, so you have to come up with cash. It's instant uh, revenue to the government. It's very profitable for them because rather than something like capital gains tax, we have to wait for a gain and measure it. This is like GST, it just taxes turnover and it captures all property. Uh, it also means no mansion effect because it, it taxes re investment as well as uh, family homes and you don't get a lock-in effect out of it either. So it, it, it dampens speculation, it murders property investors and uh, you know, in terms of property traders, life if they see a stamp duty and they have to pay 5%, well most of them survive on margins of 
20, 30, 40 thousand dollars a trade, and if you're paying five percent of the selling price for uh, for stamp duty, uh, that reduces the value of the property five percent in the short run, which really thrashes property speculators and traders. The third, the third one that we might see is risk-free rate of return. Gareth Morgan was a big fan of this. Uh, and this is where you see a deemed rate of return, for example, 5% being taxed. So if you had a property with a, say, a CV current valuation of a million dollars, the deemed rate of return might be 5%, then you just pay tax on the deemed rate of return, which would be, say, 33% of 5%, and you pay this every year. So it's kind of like a land tax, except land tax is taxing the land component. The risk-free rate of return taxes the whole value of the property. So there's three things that we might see in the future from this tax working group, uh, common recommendations that you see in OECD countries that have capital gains tax, and it wouldn't surprise me if one or a number of those actually came in. So is New Zealand in a price bubble? Are we in a bubble? Well, if you look at this graph here, uh, trough to present from... Uh, if you look at the last boom, 2002 to 2007, and you inflation adjust the uh, graph, uh, house prices went up 86%, and at present they're only up 52%. So that might surprise you, thinking that the cost basis in Auckland is so high, with million, million dollar averages, $800,000 medians, and you think, gosh, it's just sky high this cycle. But actually the cost base is sky high, but on a relative terms, uh, term inflation adjusted, look at that, we're not as high as last last time through. It's not to say it's not a bubble, but if you look at a lot of this growth, 2013 we had 80% LVR restrictions come in, and then we had all that growth, then we had 70% LVR restrictions in 2015, and in 16, late 16, we had 40% 40, 40 deposits required with 60% LVRs. So you've had all of that growth on all those massive deposits. I just don't see that being a uh, very volatile finance market because, frankly, the property market is just wealthy in New Zealand. We've got massive cash input into the properties uh, on top of a very stable banking system. If you look at the incomes and compare them to, compare them to Auckland's average income at 105,000, uh, Auckland is somewhere between 12,000 to 34,000 better off than most of New Zealand. The only region that beats Auckland on an income basis is Wellington with 109,000. Auckland at 105,000 is between 12 to 34,000 dollars better off annually for household incomes. And this funds a lot. If you divide that surplus income relative to the other area by 5%, it's going to fund a mortgage of 240 to 680,000 dollars. So before you judge Auckland's high uh, capital values and averages, consider Auckland's high incomes, they support those values and can support a lot more debt. Quick run through the data, Auckland's up 98% from the bottom of the GFC, we actually only went down 4% if you take a rolling 90 day average of medians, <laughs> a rolling 90 day average of medians, so there was a month where we actually went down 11% but there was next to no sales, it was just mortgage sales and uh, so it's not a good statistic. If you take a rolling 90-day average, we only went down 4%, which is very low volatility. And we are up 98% from the bottom of the GFC. And as you can see, we've gone up and over the top, and we're coming back down. And I think that is uh, a cyclical peak, nothing to be worried about at all. That's normal. What is under this is we have, uh, in the blue area, demand, which is household formation. That's Auckland population growth comprising net migration, and organic growth of net births and deaths, the two combined, divided by the average household size in Auckland, which is three. So population growth from migration plus organic growth of net births and deaths divided by three uh, gives you the household formation on a quarterly basis. Uh, so that's the blue line. And so that's demand for housing or increased demand for housing. And against that, we've graphed supply uh, and supply is measured by the issuance of building consents, it's a good predictor. And so when you look at the red, the issuance of consents versus the blue, the household formation, we're not making enough dwellings. That makes Auckland less volatile and it's under that 4% volatility last cycle during the GFC. Uh, we just don't have enough houses so when you do have a recession hit, 
uh, that helps underpin values. This data is up to September 2017, so it's quite recent. Uh, New Zealand versus rest of New Zealand. I, I think it's interesting to see what happens to population growth uh, over the longer term. So here we're looking at annual net migration, and Auckland gets about 60% of it uh, as an average, but in some years it's a lot more. So the blue is Auckland, uh, the orange is rest of New Zealand, and we just have recession-proof population growth in Auckland. You know, 60-70% of net migration comes to Auckland that underpins our uh, house prices here. And when you look at the recessionary periods, rest of New Zealand, orange, Auckland, blue, you can see that when we have a recession, the regions shed population, they go negative. And that's because people are looking for a job. So they either leave the regions and go to Auckland to get a job, which props up Auckland demand for housing, or they go overseas to get a job. Auckland, you'll notice right back to 1992, hasn't gone negative in any of those periods. This is not a We Love Auckland seminar, it's just a This is the Reality seminar, so uh, forgive me for uh, running through Auckland data. I'm going to do the rest of the country in a minute. Auckland population growth, some people say to me, oh, this is a recent thing. Well, this is a graph from 1926. Uh, blue is Auckland population growth, and you can see Hamilton, Wanganui, Dunedin, Christ, uh, Wellington, and so forth, and it's a long-term trend. It kind of makes sense. If you've got 100 people growing at plus 1.5% from organic growth, you get one and a half people from the breeding population. If you've got a million people, uh, then you've got 1,500 people uh, from, sorry, 15,000 people from organic growth plus 1.5%. Auckland's now at uh, 1.5 million people, uh, so you're getting 22,000 odd people just from organic growth and that 7,000 houses required just to keep up with uh, the population breeding program that's going on. Net migration's a bonus on top of that. Uh, if you look at the 10-year growth rates, 2007 to 2017, Auckland's running 11.2% straight line growth and 7.8% compounding. The rates are much higher than that if you go further back. Uh, I think that these rates must slow down. The cost base is getting so high. Uh, there's no question about that. One thing on growth rates is if you look at the regions, historically they've always kept up with Auckland's growth rates, if you go back. And in the last cycle, Auckland's jumped ahead. So based on historical trends, and this is the affordability ripple effect thing happening, uh, if Auckland has exploded in value and is now relatively unaffordable, it makes sense that more and more people will move out of Auckland to the regions, would, and that demand will lead to a catch up in values. So I think that ripple effect will play out for the next couple of years and the regions should do better than Auckland during the recession. Uh, let's look at Hamilton. Hamilton's supply demand curves, you've got uh, quarterly growth uh, for household formation there, the blue versus supply. Hamilton looking pretty undersupplied when you look at that. And it's up 62% from the bottom of the GFC Volatility was 9%, so it dropped from peak to trough 9%, and it's recovered 62 Now remember I said a minute ago the regions catch up to Auckland in growth historically. So if, Auckland, if Auckland's up 98% and Hamilton's up 62 uh, it's still got some upside there, and it's supported by pretty tight supply-demand curves. Look at Tauranga, relatively oversupplied. What is missing in this data, in the blue data, is internal population movement. We, I'm using census averages for internal population growth, because you can't see when somebody leaves Auckland and moves to Tauranga. You can see net international migration where it's going, because they fill in departure cards and arrival cards when they run through the airport. But if somebody moves from Auckland to Tauranga, we don't know. So I'm using census data for averaging internal population movements. What that graph says to me is the market rationally wouldn't build those houses uh, unless people were moving to Tauranga, so I expect the blue to be, in the next census period, adjusted to be much higher. I think there's more people moving to Tauranga than census data would indicate. Uh, house prices are up 75% from the bottom of the GFC and experience similar volatility to Hamilton at 10%. So, you know, it's quite high, Tauranga. It's a hot market, and that's got to be getting towards end of cycle sort of values there. You compare Hamilton to Tauranga, uh, Tauranga just looks more oversupplied. Hamilton looks like a better bet from a net supply demand perspective. 
and the average incomes in, in Hamilton are higher, the depth of employment is higher, the roads between Auckland and Hamilton are better, uh, I'd be a Hamilton investor before I'd be a Tauranga investor on that data. Of course, if uh, this review of the ports leads to the port moving to Tauranga, mm -hmm. as opposed to Wangarei, as Winnie's wanting it to, uh, then you'd, you'd be starting to double down on Tauranga. Wellington, oh my goodness, look at this. Highest average incomes in the country, uh, very undersupplied when you look at this graph. And of course, we know when a Labour government gets in, the employment at Wellington goes through the roof and Wellington does very well. So I've got Labour graphs all over this graph because I think Wellington is in the box seat right now. And I'm very tempted myself to go down to Wellington. Look at this, it's only up 48, 45% from the bottom of the GFC. And not only is it the highest average incomes, it's relatively undersupplied under for housing when you look at this graph here. And that pent up demand's getting higher and higher, but now it's got the government uh, being Labour government and Labour governments spend money, and Wellington does very well when uh, Labour governments spend money. So I'm interested in Wellington myself off, off that information. Christchurch, a bit of a basket case. Uh, I think that's sort of a game of two halves there. The outer suburbs uh, where everybody moved during the quake uh, have experienced massive growth, but once that Cashel Street Mall uh, remediation's done, Everybody will move back into the city once congestion moves and the dust settles, literally. Um, the CBD fringe will do better and the outer fringes of Canterbury, will st of Christchurch, will start to uh, experience a reduction in values. That's certainly the opinion of some of my clients down there and it seems to be general consensus. So it could be worth a punt. Uh, it's quite recessionary in Christchurch at the moment. Go down there and buy some land on the CBD fringe. Queenstown, uh, I don't understand this transient population, it's not a long-term population growth. It's always been a boom-bust town. Uh, look at the supply relative to demand. Uh, I think that this will come a crashing down would be my prediction uh, once uh, once we move into a, a down market. Because Queenstown's always been a very hot market. It goes way too high and then way too low during the recession. Very low average incomes in Queenstown. And of course, uh, the population that's there is very transient. It's good commercial demand, that side of thing stays pretty strong because there's, uh, you know, always tourists down there. But the residential population disappears out of there during recession, leaving residential uh, on toast, and it does experience high volatility. Uh, for those of you that are interested in assistance programs from GRA, uh, one of the things that we like to do is take people down what we call the road to taking action work out where you're trying to get to, get some knowledge, put a strategy plan in place, get the right tax structures, get the right finance, and then take action and invest. What we find is most people take action and invest, and then come and uh, ask for advice. And often they can find that the assets they've bought are in the wrong areas, or don't have the best numbers or best chance of getting growth. So do take advantage of working with us if you'd like to. Uh, have a look at our website, gra.co.nz, for, for good articles and blogs on the market. We have free property investor evenings at GRA in our new market offices. They're free. Come and have a, a chat to them. I actually run those. So if you'd like to listen to me further and get into the detail of what I discussed tonight, we do that monthly. We also have a very good school. It's a seven-week course. Check it out at our website there, GRA Property School. Uh, and we also have a, a new partner alliance program running with Auckland Property Mentors, Tua Sarsevi, uh, a very clever property investor, very good at trading and experience in the Auckland market. And uh, he's available to assist our clients moving forwards. This is, this is a slide really for Tony. And Tony, I'm reading online various uh, blogs and articles. People are starting to talk again about GFC2. Uh, Valuations peaking out, returns being at GFC, pre-GFC levels, and people are now talking about another global correction, asset values being inflated far too high with uh, you know, printed money and markets that are just awash with liquidity. Um, it kind of makes sense, but uh, we're not seeing any fear in the markets at the moment. What's your view on this? Mm, there'll be another decent downturn one day and restrictions in bank lending, increased capital requirements from central banks, regulatory authorities, etc. All these things are geared towards eventually when the unpredictable crash 
uh, or decline next crisis comes along, um, that the banking system will handle it better. So there will definitely be another one sometime, but history shows we cannot forecast when they will come, uh, what the cause will be, how deep they will be, how long they will, will last, what the recovery will look like. And just for instance, this GFC recovery period has been uh, you know, no comparison. Uh, with previous recoveries um, after crises. Um, in terms of the impact of low interest rates, it hasn't done what people were thinking would be the case uh, based on past experience. So I, I certainly don't expect one to come along, but as some share brokers are saying, you could easily get a 10 to 15% correction in world share markets at the moment, and it doesn't necessarily change the outlook, which has just been improved by the IMF and World Bank for the world economy. And generally, the data coming out of China, Australia, UK, Europe, and uh, United States, uh, not too bad. Uh, at the moment. So one day we will be surprised. I don't know if it's going to be the, the seven, eight sort of year thing in, in terms of this is when uh, declines tend to happen. If it is going to happen, it's probably going to be something to do with things going completely tits up on the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, nuclear or conventional, either, it's no good, basically. Mm. Yeah. Something disruptive, unforeseeable, etc. Yep. Well, that's a good moment to welcome you, Tony, formally. Mr. Alexander graduated from Canterbury University in 1984 with a Master's of Arts and Economics degree with First Class Honours. And after briefly working in Sydney within Westpac in Wellington, from 1987 he joined uh, the BNZ in 1993 and was appointed Chief Executive, uh, Chief Economist in uh, 1994. He spends considerable time researching and writing about the New Zealand economy with special attention to SMEs, housing and the role of Auckland in the New Zealand economy and speaks at numerous functions around the country advising businesses on what the future is like to hold. He has five children, his wife undertakes research into early child care and spends his uh, spare time maintaining a lifestyle block north of Wellington. Uh, what I like about Tony is he's a bit of an investor himself. 18 months ago he bought a disused cocktail bar in Auckland and has converted it into a 180 square metre apartment. Uh, he got into a bit of trouble with the PC Brigade this year for suggesting young people uh, looking to get into the housing market should think outside the square, maybe even buying a meth house. Uh, and it amused me to see the BNZ CEO apologised for Tony's words. <laughs> Uh, but 77% of interest.co.nz said that he should not apologise. So uh, Tony won the social media uh, yeah. war in that one. Tony's the only economist to have picked the absence of house price collapse in New Zealand as the GFC was unfolding, and the only one to correctly warn about where Auckland house prices were headed. So he's a very practical economist. He's very property aware. Uh, please welcome Tony Alexander. All right. Thanks, Matt. Okay, thanks everybody uh, online. I hope I'm not disturbing watching whatever, uh, maybe it's the second hour or something or other of uh, Merit at First Sight or, or, or something like that. But uh, yeah, I'm going to be here maybe for about 45 minutes and I'm going to focus very much on the macro scene. Um, you know, if you're interested in Auckland, uh, don't come to me with detailed questions about particular suburbs. I do not know where Takanini is. I don't know where Sandringham is. Um, I look at the overall guest out, and I like to think that's put me in relatively good stead in helping people understand why, in my opinion, this hasn't been a bubble in the Auckland housing market, you know, in different versions, you know, following around the country. So I'm going to have a look later on at the, the key factors of why this has been a repricing of Auckland and then rest of the country housing stock, not just a temporary thing, but a permanent repricing. But of course, what I'm going to focus on is uh, the new thing that's out there, the change we're all wondering um, about. Uh, and that's, of course, the uh, first uh, Labour dominated government to come in um, in 18 years. The last time they came in, the fifth Labour government, was in November of 1999. And I'll be wanting to address at some point the issue of will we see another winter of discontent? In case I forget to do so, um, my weekly overview uh, publication of August 31. I look specifically at that question, would we see a repeat of that condition of 2000? So in case I forget to do it later on, uh, you can just go and look at that publication there. Right, I want to start out with, first of all, um, the issue of why did New Zealand first go with Labour? I mean, I thought at a pinch he would go um, with National, um, and I think too many of us basically thought he, he, 
we looked at the man and we're talking in terms of he wants to leave some sort of legacy. Uh, uh, he came from national. Maybe he's going to feel more comfortable with them or, or whatever. Really, he did it on the basis of policies and uh, Labor's policies are closer to the policy platform put out by uh, New Zealand First ahead of the election. Uh, 519 individual policy points, some duplication in there, uh, New Zealand First had on their website and uh, I went through and sort of summarised them in my weekly overview of uh, September 28 um, is that one. And some of the similarities, uh, of course New Zealand First wants to ban foreigners doing well, just about anything in New Zealand apart from you know looking at the mountains and, and going skiing and, and this sort of thing. Um, and of course uh, Labour uh, have uh, for a few years had a policy of banning foreign buying of residential property. Uh, national? No. Um, both of them have wanted to cut back two different degrees on uh, migration, uh, with New Zealand First having a target of 10,000 net migration. Labor's policy is a reduction in gross migration, the number of people coming in, of 20 to 30,000. Both of them wanted to raise the minimum wage. Both of them wanting to alter the Reserve Bank Act to some extent. Both of them wanting to leave the age of eligibility for superannuation at 65. Both of them wanting to boost regional spending infrastructure. Both of them wanting to raise uh, student allowances. Both of them wanting to restart super fund contributions. Now, that doesn't mean that they're sort of love partners here. There are some differences on you know crime um, and, and punishment, uh, access to welfare, um, sort of uh, emissions, some of the green issues are there. Uh, clearly New Zealand First have uh, had quite a win in that regard. The farmers have come out of this not too bad, quite frankly. Um, New Zealand First wanted explicit targeting of the exchange rate. Uh, Labour, sensible enough to, to uh, push back, uh, obviously, on that one. And of course, uh, New Zealand First, for a while, they had a policy of uh, uh, abolish the Maori seats. I mean, it probably still is policy, but they backed away from that one um, fairly quickly. So in my own mind, in terms of uh, trying to understand uh, why did New Zealand First make that decision, the policies from Labour were closer to New Zealand First policies than the policies uh, being promoted by National. Okay, now let me have a look then at uh, should we all be scared, sorry, uh, running around like mad uh, headless chooks there thinking the sky is going to fall. Uh, should you be thinking it's going to be a greeny revolution? Is it the return of cloth cap unionism? Is it the return of Muldoonism? You know, there's all sorts of theories out there. Um, USA Today uh, today was uh, writing that uh, our new prime minister um, is in the Trumpian uh, sort of camp there. Um, completely misreading it. Go to the Australian newspaper. Oh no, she's a commie who's going to send us down some sort of a, a Russian gurgler. Uh, Bolshevik Revolution. Um, I always laugh when I, I read the commentaries from overseas looking at New Zealand. They talk about sort of extremities that they may be used to over there, whereas here in New Zealand uh, we have actively voted against parties looking to make major changes pretty much since the early um, 1990s. When National were explicitly voted in, in uh, was it 89 or 1990, to finish the job well, they did with the deregulatory uh, reforms there. And then since about 1992 or 93, everything in New Zealand, apart from the winter of discontent, has been relatively slow moving on the reform front. And we generally haven't felt that anything major has needed to be changed. But before I get to why then have we got this Labour dominated government, let me just introduce what happened in the winter of discontent in 2000. Um, back then, pre election, uh, we saw a net 25% of businesses saying, yeah, we're happy about the economy. Within one year, a net 35% of businesses are saying, no, we've got a really bad outlook uh, for, the, uh, for the economy. Um, business confidence essentially collapsed. Consumers' confidence also went down, um, but by nowhere near uh, as much. Now, there are a number of things happening back then that are not happening now. One of them, the Reserve Bank uh, from pre-election in '99. Uh, and seven months later, increased its official cash rate 2%, from 4.5% to 6.5%. We don't think the Reserve Bank is likely to start raising interest rates this cycle until maybe late next year. Uh, the Reserve Bank don't think they'll be raising interest rates until late 2019. So, very different interest rate scenario. Back then, there was still a lot of debate about the nature of workplace relations, industrial reform in New Zealand, and the government replaced the Employment Contracts Act with the Employment Relations 
uh, Act, uh, sort of backtracking away from a heavily deregulated labour market, moving back towards a greater role for unions, etc. And businesses were very concerned that it may be a return to sort of 1970s, 1980s sort of uh, uh, unionism. So huge uncertainty there. The second thing that uh, Michael Cullen did as incoming finance minister uh, back then was to raise the top marginal income tax rate from 33% to 39%. Government running surpluses didn't need the extra money. It was basically a soak the rich sort of thing. Sort of thing. Um, no, this time around uh, we uh, finally had the uh, promise from the uh, uh, incoming prime minister, uh, uh, no income tax rate uh, uh, change and uh, everything going through the uh, tax working group. Back then, the incoming government basically felt that they had been given a mandate to ignore the business sector. And for about a year, they did. They, uh, working at the BNZ, myself still at the time, we engaged some lobbyists to represent us, just to you know, build up relationship with the government. Uh, I think we got rid of them within about a year when it was pretty clear the government had no interest in listening to the business sector. They eventually learnt they needed that relationship there. But it was a very different government coming in back then, dominated with a lot of sort of a, I guess, a revenge uh, mentality, uh, etc. Back then we also had the dot-com share market crash from March 2000 going on, and we had net migration losses of about 11,000 per annum in early 2000. Well, you know, things are vastly different um, this time around. So uh, we've got, what, strong commodity prices lifting up the New Zealand commodity, uh, sorry, economy at the moment, tourism growing strongly untold stuff needed to, to be uh, built, infrastructure, there's obviously going to be a burst in infrastructure spending um, in the regions, uh, the technology sector growing very, very strongly. There is a fiscal stimulus coming, so many businesses will be saying, well actually this is quite good, the government's going to be spending more money, more public servants, uh, rebuilding police force, education sector, health sector, a lot of opportunities are going, going to go open up in these uh, areas. This time around yeah, there's, there's an absence of reform fatigue. Back then there was a feeling of people, like I say, were just sort of you know, tired of reforms. Um, this time around it's simply not on the agenda. Um, with St Peter's using la language of sort of the end of capitalism, neoliberalism, etc. We, we don't talk with that terminology in New Zealand. It's not sort of, I'd suggest, hitting any sort of resonance with people out there apart from a few other sort of um, old um, Muldoonists. Which sort of takes me to another way of, a, of addressing a similar thing, why I do not believe this is the end of days, that it's time to pack up bags and bludge off the cuzzies over in Sydney or Perth or that, that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and so just running fewer th few extremities one might go to, is this an intergenerational attack? Is this the young people coming in to soak, you know, uh, uh, get it all over the older generation? Well, no. Mr. Peters is 72 years old. He explicitly recognises the older generation who are getting uh, the super gold card sort of extra benefits, etc., uh, um, coming uh, along there. Um, no, it's not, I would suggest, a government which is looking to do a wholesale transfer of wealth or anything necessarily from an older generation, baby boomers, uh, etc., um, towards the younger people. Is it return of cloth cap unionism? Um, most definitely no. Although Labor's workplace relations policy has about 34 individual items they're going to run through there, um, and it will increase the power of uh, unions, etc., um, in New Zealand. Um, Business New Zealand, they've had extensive discussions, it seems, with the uh, Council of Trade Unions on this, and uh, they've come out uh, convinced that this isn't going to lead to nationwide strikes, the fair pay agreements which are going to be put in place uh, stretching across industries, only one to two a year will be done according to the Prime Minister-elect, uh, she said over the uh, weekend, and the unions have said no, they are not seeking the ability to strike in support of these sort of industry-wide agreements. Um, so th there just isn't that sort of uh, situation in New Zealand of unionism as across in, in, in Australia. There will be an increase in union power, workplace access, etc. But I don't look at what they're proposing there and think to myself, oh my goodness, uh, we're all going to be singing, singing the international, you know, some sort of Bolshevik uh, revolution thing <laughs> there at all. Is it a revenge government? Are, are they looking to get payback? Because this sort of is what came through with some of the comments and I guess actions by the, the, the previous incoming finance minister uh, for a Labour government, uh, Michael Cullen, um, where he said fairly on uh, when Parliament opened then, uh, we won, you lost, uh, eat that. And when he was elected to Parliament in his opening speech, he said, thanks to the rich pricks who put me uh, through a subsidy, uh, a scholarship at uh, Ch uh, Christ College um, in, uh, in Christchurch. Uh, no, I, I haven't picked up that. 
coming through from the Labour candidates uh, this this sort of uh, time. I don't think they feel that they have a mandate to to exact any sort of revenge or big turning around uh, in, in reforms. Is it Auntie Helen's social engineering? Well, this is interesting because um, she sort of injected herself into everything there, making herself available for um, discussions with germ uh, journalists, even from a bus in London at the weekend, the journalist was sort of proudly uh, 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 saying. So, yeah, she's sort of sniffing around the, the whole thing there, like, uh, you know, just sort of a bit interested. Um, but I don't perceive that uh, the incoming Prime Minister is going to necessarily look towards uh, our previous uh, Prime Minister, Helen Clark, as a guide towards things like, you know, instructing people what shower head you could use, um, what light bulbs we've got to get, uh, have that sort of thing. Is it a greeny revolution? Well, if you have a look at the uh, agreement details, uh, to the extent there are details that came out um, this afternoon, the Greens definitely have not got what they wanted from the farmers. Winston Peters has clearly been in there protecting them. Existing subsidies for irrigation schemes continue. There will be a, uh, a review uh, investigation into bringing farmers into the emissions trading scheme, but if they are brought in, only initially 5% of their emissions will be brought into the uh, into the scheme. The, uh, so the, the Green Party definitely have sort of not got what they were not wanting for um, in that regard. No, uh, as far as I can see yet, um, special assistance to dairy farmers to close down and convert to growing something. Hemp, maybe. Uh, might come back to the uh, marijuana thing later on. Um, is it a return of Muldoonism? Because this is the camp that Winston Peters comes from, highly nationalistic, um, you know, hence the, the the ban the foreign buying and cut immigration, um, etc. Well, certainly there are a few people out there who, uh, ever since the snap election of uh, '84, have been hoping for the return of such. Um, this is not on the cards. I do not, would not, never, I think, put the incoming uh, young Labour MPs cabinet there in the Muldooners camp of let's control the economy. I don't think that they feel necessarily that the economy has failed. What I, in spite of some of the commentary from uh, the incoming Prime Minister, so what then am I seeing this as a government of? What do I think they want to achieve? I don't feel they want to achieve an unwinding of economic reforms. I don't feel they want to achieve a great uh, resurrection of the government's role in our um, business lives, our personal lives, etc. What I think they want to achieve is what many of us have been saying for, I guess, a number of years now, that uh, we, we tend to view national as the natural government, natural party, uh, forming government in New Zealand, but every now and then we as Kiwis will feel that there are some blind spots that have developed, that some people maybe are getting left behind, that maybe uh, government policies are not adequately addressing some of the gaps which have opened up. And my view was that if Labor did not form the government this time, they were well quids in to do it in three years' time. And I just looked out, or listened, uh, to the uh, Jacinda Ardern's the comments at the Q&A um, interview. She led off by talking about you know, what the government was about. And I don't think any of us are really going to object to fairly much almost any, anything in this list. Homelessness that New Zealand, according to an OECD study, has sort of the highest homelessness rate uh, among that grouping. It would seem fairly positive if changes are made to address homelessness. Housing affordability, of course, for young people um, has structurally deteriorated. I'm going to run through why. I don't think they're going to make the dent that they would like to make on it, but I think most of us, especially with myself, five kids coming through, um, would like to see eventually some improvement in housing affordability and, of course, the quality. One of the key points I'd like to get across is there has been a societal shift in, I guess, the proportion of people who are going to be renting and renting over a longer time period than was the case in the past. You have to expect that legislation will shift to give greater power, representation, etc., for that proportion who are doing the renting over a longer term. Tenants' rights, you know, right of renewal of tenancies, all these sort of things. And, of course, the quality of the housing stock. A lot of the stock which has been um, uh, built in New Zealand are uh, ages old, bit of a lack of insulation, uh, the other sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, subsidies towards improving all that sort of stuff. It seems like a positive thing. Foreigners, when they come to New Zealand, they, they are aghast at our terrible driving ability. 
and the quality of, of the home that they purchase. And then their assumption about how quickly they can get the home uh, up to the standards that they want, finding uh, that they can't get Polish plumbers, this sort of thing. A another reason for the uh, focus of the gov this government, clearly the, the environment, um, emissions, uh, climate change, river cleanliness, not nowhere near as rapidly the movement in this area as Greens and many in Labour would like, but that's, that's what she emphasised. Child poverty, addressing that, who could argue? Wages growth. Now, New Zealand isn't special here. Um, we have had, I think, good wages growth uh, of about 40%. Average wages higher now than they were 10 years ago. Household incomes have increased about 40% over this period of time, and inflation has only been 20% total over the past uh, uh, 10 years. But in common with other countries around the world, strong jobs growth is not leading to an acceleration in the pace of wages growth. It's even slowing down in Australia. New Zealand isn't special, and I'm not convinced that what they're looking at doing will actually greatly change that dynamic, because none of us around the world, us, Reserve Banks, OECD, yet feel we can adequately say this is exactly why wages growth hasn't accelerated this time around. Internationalisation of the labour market, casual work, part-time work, AI, robotisation, whatever the heck, there's a whole lot going through there. But um, addressing wages growth, you know, it's reasonable to expect a little bit of an acceleration. Regional development, clearly they're focusing on that. We learned today, $1 billion regional development fund per annum. There could be some interesting stuff slash white elephants built out there in the regions. <laughs> That's going to be interesting to, to, to look at. Um, and of course, uh, they've also focused on this foreign buying of assets. For me, primarily what the government is about is sort of the values that she was criticised as espousing by uh, National going into the election there, but addressing some of the gaps, uh, helping some people catch up. And it's a lesser version of what led to the election of uh, Donald Trump as president in the United States. A whole grouping of people in the Midwest uh, who had been left behind and felt they did not have a voice. And a number of us have been identifying these past sort of one or two years. In New Zealand, where have maybe people felt they've been a little bit left behind? Some of it's young versus old, uh, some of the children, the housing affordability, regional development, and this, this interestingly is what they're looking at addressing. Now, uh, what are we looking at? Uh, economic outlook, uh, before I get into some of the broader policy specifics here, our outlook for the economy is pretty much the same as everybody else out there. It's, it's still positive. Um, I do not agree that there are some massive dark clouds on the horizon and people should be girding their loins for a major downturn. Um, I don't know what it is Winston Peters thinks that he is uh, seeing out there to cause a, a major decline in the economy. Uh, when we look at things such as world growth forecasts have been improved recently. The tourism sector requires a lot of investment. Over the past 12 months, the value of consents issued for new motels and hotels to be built around the country has risen 204%. There's half a billion dollars worth of these consents issued in the past 12 months. So the tourist numbers growth, it means lots of spending by the visitors, but it's been very sudden, this boom in tourism from three or so years ago, and infrastructure has to catch up. There's a multiplier stimulatory effect on the economy from this. Construction. I mean, not just motels, hotels, but there is a lot of stuff to be built around uh, the country, um, and predominantly, of course, um, houses um, up in Auckland. Um, I'll come back to that, but key point I've been making for some time is we're not in a boom-bust cycle for construction overall. It's a lot of construction at a high level for a number of years. People wanting who would love to do something at the moment uh, but cannot get the finance or cannot get the builders, maybe they do it in two or three years' time. So what would have been a, a Gold Coast-like boom at the moment next year, maybe the year after, and there may be a bust beyond that, um, the whole thing is smoothed out over a much longer period of time. Um, the labour market is very strong. Businesses say, we can't get skilled people. We can't get unskilled people. We can't get digger drivers who don't fail you know, drug tests, you know, this, this sort of thing. Um, the labour market is strong. It's delivering some pretty good job security. Uh, out there. So that leaves me reasonably confident that people are going to still be, you know, sniffing around to try and upgrade their accommodation. I'm still looking to get a, you know, a new Mustang or a Mazda or something like that, and a few more couches, this sort of thing. You know, consumer spending outlook is, is reasonable. Um, and of course, there's a stimulatory fiscal policy coming along. The government is going to spend more than National were looking um, at doing. 
Um, and so that you know, obviously adds to the pace of growth in the economy. Um, a couple of negatives there, just restraints on the pace of growth in the economy. One, of course, is net uh, migration. Uh, Labor are looking at cutting back you know, on, um, uh, by about 20 to 30,000 on the numbers coming in, not the skilled people, but they'll look to uh, cut back a lot of it in the education sector. If you're a foreigner looking to come to New Zealand to study, if you are doing a bachelor's degree, you're sort of away laughing. Um, but if you're looking to do something less than bachelor's, it's got to be a pretty special course accredited by the Tertiary Education Commission or the, I think, New Zealand Qualifications Authority was the other one. They expect you know, that in conjunction with the rule they want to introduce whereby you cannot do any work while you're a student in New Zealand unless you're doing a bachelor's. So if you're just doing your retail supervision diploma, you won't be able to work, basically. That's sort of looking at stripping out maybe you know, 12, 15,000 um, um, students um, overall. And uh, the rule whereby uh, if you graduate, uh, you can get a work visa automatically. Kind of leave that in place if you're doing a degree, bachelor's degree at least. Uh, but if you haven't done a bachelor's degree, you know, get no work visa. You've got to leave the country, basically. And they expect these measures, along with a cutback on issuing of work visas for what they will unspecified consider very low skilled jobs. Overall, they think it may add up to twenty to thirty thousand reduction in low skilled uh, people coming in. Yes, the hit will be predominantly in Auckland, um, in a city. But of course, as we've seen in the news yesterday, Queenstown worried about uh, uh, hospitality staff coming through. Uh, businesses throughout New Zealand are dependent upon foreigners coming along and servicing other foreigners in the bars, in the hostels, etc. So this is interesting because there is a regional economic development focus from this government. And I would not be surprised at all if as an overlay on these restrictions uh, for the work visas, there are exemptions provided for particular locations such as uh, 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 Queenstown. Um, uh, for instance. So there's a lot of water to go under the bridge there. In Auckland, inner city, yes, the apartment market will suffer some weakening. And for many of these apartments, it'll mean that instead of having two or three students per bedroom, or three or four, you're down to one or two or two or three, something like that, because we know they've been crammed in there. Early this year, uh, there was an advertisement in the paper for $170 a week uh, rental for being in an Auckland apartment. Lower bunk. You know, and the journalists thought, oh my God, they're, 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 they're sharing bedrooms in here, these poor, poor students, they're, they're bunking up. And they interviewed um, a bunch of these Indian students, and they, of course the journalists wanted a story that this is terrible, we're crammed in here. And the response from the students is, this is fantastic. You should see how many of us there are back in India living cheek by jowl. And they, they were absolutely loving it here in New Zealand. They're eating out, um, they're seeing a future for themselves, potential residency, etc. So I thought that was interesting. So it won't be a complete sort of some of the, the numbers that Matthew had there. Um, I just guess, I, I guess I'd knock back that even if they got the 30,000 total reduction in gross migration coming through, these people um, are not requiring um, 10,000 houses. Um, they're, 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 a lot of them are already crammed in. Um, to existing accommodation, but there will be, be an impact there. Overall, pretty much all of us are looking at a reasonable outlook for our economy going through for 2.5% uh, growth, something like that. Not really an acceleration, not with a shortage of, of staff, etc. Um, out there. Some businesses, okay, as the wages are going up now, so getting into some specifics here, I, I should have sort of stopped and paused just there. I'm moving now a bit more into some policy specifics. And I've just jumped right into workplace uh, uh, policy there and, and wages. Um, and so the government from April 1st uh, next year, minimum wage will go from $15.75 adult wage uh, per hour up to $16.50 and then work towards $20 an hour coming in, I guess it's looking like April to 2021. Now, personally, I have long advocated an acceleration of the pace of wages growth in New Zealand. Why? Because we have a lot of people doing jobs where they're very happy doing those jobs. Somebody up the road, though, is willing to pay them two bucks more an hour if they go and work for them. But they don't want to go and work for them because they're happy doing what they do, they're making enough money, etc. Capitalism thrives by a process of creative destructionalism. Firms which are inefficient can no longer cut it, go out of business, and their people, their premises, their, their, their machinery, whatever, it gets freed up for other uses. And one of the most vital elements in this is wages growth, that as wages go up, 
inefficient businesses who don't have a product that they can reform, lift the price for, they go out of businesses. The employees are reallocated by the labour market to higher productive areas. And I think this is one reason why productivity growth is relatively low around the world, including in New Zealand. Our low productivity growth, yeah, there's nothing special. It's, 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 it's a worldwide thing. I think it is a lack of wage, uh, strong enough wages growth. I find myself in favour of an acceleration in the pace of wages growth, but it is going to hit some businesses out there. They will be having to source to develop their robot technology, robot serving of you and I in the bars, you know, uh, this sort of thing. Supermarkets are going to have to go more down the route of robotization, you and I uh, uh, using those uh, automatic checkout uh, sort of things as, uh, as well. Uh, monetary policy. Now, the changes in monetary policy, uh, in my opinion, not going to be large enough to actually alter any interest rate outlook. So what Labour are looking at doing there is, number one, monetary policy will be decided not with the final say to the governor, or acting governor at the moment, but to a committee, including some outside representatives. Now, this is the norm overseas, quite frankly. It's done by committees. Um, I don't think it at all means, frankly, any different interest rate track going forward from what would otherwise be the case, because there's already a committee operating three senior Reserve Bank people giving advice to the Reserve Bank governor. Um, the Labour government uh, will require that the Reserve Bank target full employment. Uh, this is common overseas. I worked at the Reserve Bank of Australia in, um, in Australia and Sydney there in the uh, end of 84 through 85. And uh, emblazoned in the, uh, one of the big plaques, whatever, down the bottom is uh, they implement monetary policy to target uh, external account balance, uh, full employment, uh, strong economic growth and low inflation. Four targets with just one thing they can change, uh, pretty much uh, the interest rate. Um, the Labor government would like unemployment going down to 4%, it's 4.8 at the moment. They will not put that in the legislation. They will put full employment in there, but around the world, central banks, it's a normal thing to have it. They still pretty much focus on the inflation outlook. You ever let inflation get out from under you and start rocketing away, you will probably have to cause a recession, which will destroy people's lives in order to get it back under control. So I have no, no concern uh, about the monetary policy changes that they are proposing. Fiscal policy, well, Labor were at pains ahead of the election to present a responsible fiscal policy track. Now, what I'm talking about fiscal policy is policies of taxation, raising revenue, and spending, uh, health, education, welfare, defence, police, you know, all these sorts of things. That, that's fiscal policy stuff. Now. Labour had a, little, have had a little bit of a history, the fourth and fifth Labour governments, of fiscal policy going out the window. Uh, the control was not so good for the fourth Labour government from 1984 through to 1989. It was very good fiscal policy in terms of running surpluses under Michael Cullen until his last budget in 2008. And then he just got the hammer and whacked all the spigots out of the way and just let the government money flow like there was no tomorrow. So fiscal rectitude completely went out the window. So uh, the uh, Labour Party, of course, was quite aware that many people uh, have legitimately had concerns about their ability to um, keep good fiscal reins in place. So they have a number of budget responsibility rules. The three important ones are they intend to run operating surpluses on average over the economic cycle. Sounds fantastic. Um, they plan reducing the ratio of government net debt to GDP from 22% at the moment, yeah, uh, to 20%. <laughs> fantastic. Um, they plan limiting um, government spending as a ratio of the size of the economy to the 30% of GDP, government spending versus GDP, of about the last 20 years. Um, it's projected that that spending will be about 28.5% come 2022. So there is space for them to increase spending a bit more than is in their numbers at the moment over the next you know, uh, three years or so. But overall, I look at the fiscal policy. And I tell you what, anybody looking at this from overseas will go, um, they don't look like communists to me. <laughs> it looks like some pretty darn responsible stuff. Immigration, I've already actually uh, gone through the, uh, the focus very much on the low value workers um, coming in with a few extra coming in with exceptional skills and on the Kiwi Build um, program. One motivating factor is the exploitation of many of these students, uh, the work visa migrants at the moment, usually unfortunately by their own people um, who are saying, we'll give you a job, there's your work visa, I'll pay you the minimum wage, uh, uh, sure, but you're going to pay me $20,000 a year for the job. 
uh, this sort of thing has been rampant out there, unfortunately, as some communities. Exploitation, we've seen it in Australia in the 7-Eleven stores. Um, so there's a bit of a social issue they're looking to address uh, 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 there. And I mentioned staff availability is going to get worse. On the housing side, yeah, Matthew's already gone through extensively there. Let me just go through my little list of things um, here. Um, banning foreign buyers. I assume they're going to, I suppose, let the Aussies buy here. Us Kiwis and Aussies can buy whatever we want in Australia. Um, so, yeah. And that's probably what they're going to do here. Maybe I guess they'll still let the Aussies in, in, in here. Uh, but everybody else, they can only buy something new. Now, this may not necessarily lead to the withdrawal of foreigners from buying in New Zealand as they are hoping because uh, there's a shortage of development finance in New Zealand. We banks this year have pulled back from providing development finance. Think of it in terms of if we're going to lend to a developer or anybody in New Zealand, we've got to raise the money in New Zealand as well. New Zealand has a big vulnerability to foot and mouth disease, Mount Rangatoto, going up as I'm looking out the window out in the distance there uh, at the moment in the dark, and our dependence on foreign financing. Ahead of the GFC, the global financial crisis, 45% of every dollar that we banks in New Zealand lent to you for your overdraft, your mortgage, your business, credit card, we had to get from foreigners. We Kiwis, we hate saving, and we rely on other people's money for our day-to-day -day life. Well, we've got that down earlier this year to 29% of the money we lend you, it comes from foreigners. So this is an improvement, this is good. It's still too high, that's what the IMF, the International Monetary Fund said six months ago. It's also now around 31%, it started to go back up again because you see, people wanna borrow money to grow their tourism businesses, construction, technology, etc. But no, we, we can raise the money overseas, us banks, but we can't because it's just going to increase vulnerability in the New Zealand economy. The next time a global hit comes along and the foreigners say, we don't want to lend you any more money, we don't know what's happening, we just want it beside ourselves in Austria, South Korea, Japan, UK, Germany, etc. That's a vulnerability for us. Um, and so for us banks, what's the group we've pulled back most on? The riskiest sector you can pretty much ever lend to in any economy on any planet, um, property development. And so this sort of cuts to the heart of the housing thing there. Let's say the uh, Labor can eventually get up to securing the builders, the companies, the carpenters, etc., to sign up to building 10,000 affordable homes per annum. Well, the, the builders aren't there, so the builders will need to come away from other other, other projects um, for a start. And anyway, at the moment, the development finance is not there for a lot of these other projects to go ahead um, anyway. But some of the Chinese companies coming in, um, they, they have the finance maybe themselves, or of course they can arrange it with retail investors from overseas. Um, I'm not convinced that the resources will be available at all for labor to get their building of 10,000 affordable homes. If they do, that'll mean an undersupply of middle to upper priced homes. Interesting price differential thing could go there. Restraint on property 600 grand and less in Auckland uh, and a bit of upward pressure on other prices. Lots of water to go under which there. Bright line test mentioned, lost ring fencing, uh, dole for apprenticeships, so try and get 4,000 apprenticeships through and give a dole subsidy to the employers there. Remove Auckland zoning. There is not a shortage of land to be developed in Auckland. There's a shortage of finance. There's a shortage of builders. Um, and some of the other stuff as uh, as services. well, services, all, yeah, all these sort of things. So upshot of all that is that, yeah, they want to try and, none of this is really addressing homelessness, so I'm not sure what they're going to do quite in, in that regard. Um, they're concerned about housing affordability. Will they make a big impact on housing affordability? No, they will not. And so I'm going to run through a little list here of things I've been pointing out to people for some time. And when I said early on, this is a repricing of New Zealand's housing stock, which is large, which has been completed in Auckland now. Houses these days are not like houses that were built in the old days. Um, these days the toilets are on the inside. There's usually more than one toilet as well. The materials being used are tested. The standards being built towards earthquake standards are higher. Home insulation, energy efficient standards are higher. The average size of a house getting put up these days is about 200 square metres. Back then in the early 70s, late 60s, it was about 120 square metres. Here's a key one. You go and buy a house back in the 1970s, one income was buying the house. Usually the male income was buying the house. The price of houses reflected the ability to buy of one income in the household. As females entered the workforce from the, the, the 1970s, those who had two incomes coming in could afford a much better house and 
the price of houses started to structurally get bid up a little bit, a little bit. And at the moment, we, we all say to each other, you want to buy a house, you need both partners working. Well, that's what's happened over time. The house prices are being built up because households now often have two people working and bringing in an income. So this societal change towards females uh, are working uh, almost as much as males, not quite, um, has led to the price of houses reflects two people in the household being able to buy, not just one income being supplied. We, we have had new foreign buyers appear over the past few years. I, I don't think they're going to suddenly be selling out from New Zealand if they've got an existing holding in here, but that's a new thing around the world, foreign buyers and domestic residential markets that wasn't there before. We've had a structural decline in the level of interest rates. The first big structural decline was in 1992. Inflation went from 11% to 2%. Term deposit rates in banks went from 12% to 6%. Some people moved into property back then. Some older investors went to finance companies. This time around, my belief is three to four years ago, uh, older people, they, they lost faith that the interest rates were going to be bumping back up from 3.5% term deposit rate to 5 or 6%. They've been looking for alternatives, taking money away from banks, hence why we can't raise the money in New Zealand, because the money we want to raise from people in New Zealand to lend to you for your mortgage, we've got to get it from the old folks. And uh, they basically are, are looking to uh, get a better return on doing something else, uh, uh, quite frankly, with their, with their money. Um, and what else do I have there? Uh, uh, yeah, so structural reduction in interest rates. It's ironic that when I got my first house, um, for your guide, uh, September 1987, <laughs> one month before the share market crash, um, I paid 18.5%. Who'd have thought I was better off buying back then at 18.5% than a young person buying now at 4.5%? Um, interest rates. It's, 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 it's ironic in terms of what uh, the money will buy. Other things uh, that have changed, there's been a long-term change in the net migration flows. Now, at the moment, everybody's going to be focusing on the change in total net migration from the peak two months ago of 72,400. It's 71,000 in the past year now. You'll be running numbers through your head of it's dropping to 40,000, all this sort of thing. Ideal in the longer term picture. And the longer term picture is this. So if, you, if you've got a pen and paper here, this is what you write down. In the 10 years ending in 1986, 10 years finishing in 1986, on average in each of those 10 years, we had a net migration loss for New Zealand of 17,000 people, 17,000 people. Brain drain, last one out, turn the light off, all this sort of thing. In the 10 years ending 1996, on average each year, we had a net migration gain of 3,000 people per, per annum on average. In the 10 years ending 2006, we had a net migration gain of 11,000 people per annum. In the 10 years ending 216 slash 217, we've had a net migration gain of 25,000 people. And what I've tried to do here running through these numbers is put a rising line in your head. There is a trend shift in New Zealand's net migration flows towards inflows, inflows higher now than was the case in the past. And I could rabbit on for ages here talking about New Zealand no longer being a big farm, the role of Auckland in the economy, etc. But that's another reason for the repricing of the housing stock. And there's a whole lot of other stuff in there, but it adds up to one of my key points for sort of a few years now, this is a repricing. When now we've reached the new equilibrium in Auckland, we now settle down for five years with little bits of up and little bits of down, but a down to start with, and then whatever further down the track. And as this next year goes by, the rest of the country will go through the same phase um, as well. Now, I'm a quarter Irish, and I could actually sit here and rabbit it on in total for about three hours, I figured out uh, a few years ago. But um, I've sort of gone through a lot of the main things I have wanted to say here. Um, and my main point is that this is a change in government and we are uncertain about exactly what they are about, but it's not dominated by Muldoonist New Zealand First People. It's not dominated by greenies. It's not dominated by unionists, soak the rich. There's not a revenge mentality. This is a government about addressing some of the people who've been left behind, some who maybe haven't enjoyed the wealth growth or the income growth or the opportunities maybe that you and I have over this period of time. And some people are going to suffer some losses, some hits as a result of this rebalancing. It's going to be some of the businesses who hire 
the low paid employees. It's gonna be an impost on them. And sort of the unfettered rain, uh, the rise in the housing market, well, there is a structural shift in the balance of power now moving towards the tenants and a bit less on the landlord side. The length of tenancy, frequency of rent reviews, you know, it's moving a wee bit more towards the overseas model where uh, they've been used to these sort of long-term rental markets for a, for a longer period of time, decades than say the case in New Zealand. So Matthew, sort of that's a, uh, 45 minutes I wanted to do on that. Uh, Tony, <coughs> fabulous, thank you very much. I was uh, quietly relaxing listening to you there. Um, some interesting comments coming through. Uh, where do you see interest rates going? Okay, good question, thank you. Um, outlook for interest rates. My view is that I don't believe the Reserve Bank is sitting there thinking these changes will aggressively push up the pace of wages growth. These changes will aggressively improve the ability of companies to raise their prices. One reason inflation is in low in New Zealand and overseas is that I, as a consumer now, if you're trying to sell me a good and I think the price is too high, if you've made it $10 more than I anticipated, if this was the 1970s, I'll pay the price and I'll go and strike for an extra percentage wage growth. No, no, no. These days, if you charge me 10 bucks more than I think, I'll go, no, 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 no. I'll look on my cell phone. No, they've got it cheaper at Bunnings. I can buy it for a one third of the price off Alibaba overseas. Um, margin management has gone out the window for so many businesses. That's why retailers are suffering. Um, the, the consumer spending growth is quite good. Um, and I don't think the Reserve Bank people will be sitting there going, oh, there's a structural shift in the power of retailers to raise prices or businesses generally. And while there will be an uptick in the pace of wages growth, um, I think there's quite a bit of scope for that to sort of sort of happen without the Reserve Bank thinking this is really going to cause things to rocket away. Um, I don't think they'll be revising up with their growth forecast in anticipation of a fiscal stimulus because there's a couple of offsetting factors in there. So my view is it's still reasonable to be thinking maybe in about a year's time they start to raise interest rates and they'll do it relatively gradually. Just for your guide, however, there was one other point I wanted to put in here. The chances of LVRs being eased, I bet there's got to be a question like yeah. that in there. I think the chances have gone up because we now have these extra restrictions coming into the housing market and the need for the likes of you know 40% minimum de deposit requirement um, will be dropping away. I think this has increased the chances of the Reserve Bank easing the LVRs within the next 12 months. And interestingly, both uh, Jacinda and Bill said during the election that they saw, or well, that neither of them liked the LVRs. Mm. And with that, that was just populist comments. Uh, both of them said they were anti-DTIs, and both of them said that they were anti-LVRs. Yeah. What, and so, you know, I saw that as a very positive thing. Where do you see the dollar going? Yeah, Kiwi dollar, I profess zero ability to forecast the currency. I have no accurate record in it, and I don't think any other poor economist uh, pretty much has um, um, either. Uh, my view, however, is that for the moment, ah, forget it, it's gonna be all over the place, okay, the, the currency for the moment, there, there is a change, there's a new thing. So it's natural the currency weakens away a bit as investors go, oh, don't know what this means, let's just downweight a little bit on New Zealand. But look at New Zealand from overseas, you know, uh, what have we got, I think, second or third least corrupt economy around the world. Uh, freest economy, ease of setting up business, all these sort of readings. The government, despite the GFC, and the Christchurch earthquake and the Kaikoura earthquake is running surpluses, surpluses that are predicted to grow embarrassingly large um, in future years. We've got a deregulated labour market. We've got a relatively quiescent, you know, sort of quiet union movement. Uh, we've got chaos. Um, we're, we're selling agricultural commodities to the Chinese. Um, and so I don't believe that, say, the rest of the world will look at us and go, oh, you've munted now. Uh, uh, your political situation, oh, it's, 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 it's really bad and, uh, and we're now really feeling happy about political situation in Brexit UK, Brexit Europe, you know, Spain, uh, Australia for God's sakes, um, America. We really stick out as relatively positive. Personally, I wouldn't be surprised if the Kiwi dollar slowly edges back up again. Our official view of the BNZ is it goes down, but my gut says to me maybe there's some upside uh, further out. But, like I say, I profess no ability to forecast the poor currency. Very interesting. Uh, it's a shame I can't turn on the webcam because uh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm showing Tony a 12 watt LED dimmable light with a driver, which I bought on AliExpress. And I landed this, a box full of them of 20 on my desk for $3 each. Oh, holy cow. And this is $30 in Auckland. Yep, it is. 
And uh, I then thought, well, I'd like to install this in my house, my, my investment properties, and save lots of money. So I asked my electrician, he said, well, you'll need an electrical certificate for that. So uh, I asked an electrical engineer, and he said, yeah, I'll give you an electrical certificate. It's 10 grand to get one. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this raises a real um, opportunity but issue with New Zealand's construction costs. Yeah. And this is something that I wanted to ring Winston about and say, hey, the, you should get on your um, campaign horse about this. You know, there is nothing wrong with this. I've yeah. tested this. Yeah. It, it's fire rated. It's got it's actually a um, fire rated mm. um, unit, and it's three bucks. But you're going to pay thirty dollars in Auckland for it. Uh, we need to do something about this. We need brands and central government to make it much more cost effective to yep. get these goods in. Another example of this was I looked at minor dwellings out of China. And I sent them a set of plans. The company that I sent it to have a production line that's 21 kilometres long. Oh, and th they just have endless production capacity. And I said, how much to build this uh, minor dwelling? Material cost. Put it in a container. I bolt it together in a day and a half. It comes uh, fat packed. It's a day and a half to construct it. It's insulated, double glazed, pre-wired, pre-plumbed, toilets, bathrooms, painted, curtained, carpeted, everything. Turnkey, they said, uh, it's thirty-one thousand dollars New Zealand. Yeah. This. And I and I wrote back and said, this is outrageous. I'm going to buy a hundred, <laughs> using the old, you know, um, order, ask for a hundred and then order two. <laughs> uh, and they came back and they said, okay, well, uh, negotiated hard, so they wanted to do it for twenty-one thousand. <laughs> Goodness. Twenty-one grand. Yeah. Now the material cost of that in New Zealand is eighty to hundred grand. Yeah. And. Then you've got labour. Then you've got all the government costs on top of that. It comes in at two twenty. Right. But eighty to hundred, you get, you're talking twenty five percent of the cost of that. Uh, mm. And I think that there's a solution yep. for low cost housing offshore. It's yep. called China. Yeah. And the problem is not China. The problem is brands and uh, the cartels that are the DIY companies preventing this happening. And there's something needs to be done about this. So anyway, I wanted to get that in there and show you that. It's an interesting story. Mm. Uh, one more comment. Somebody here has said that Jacinda has said that the definition of a new house for a foreign buyer is a house that the foreign buyer builds. Yes. So, and of course, they, this person could have misheard this, mm. but they, they are saying, and there's no policy issued, so we don't know, right. but they're saying the definition of a new house built by a foreign buyer would require them to buy the land and pay for the construction, which would be much more restrictive than I'm thinking it is. The Australian model is you can buy a new house of a developer. I would imagine that's where it goes. That, that's where it'll be going. Yeah. I, I can't see them um, requiring, imagine that. Imagine the newspapers reporting on that. Mm -hmm. Labor government is requiring Chinese builders to expand in New Zealand. No. Um, I, I just made, made a note down there, I've often said, look, if we were truly serious about addressing the housing affordability issue in New Zealand, we'd be saying, rightio, let's let in 50,000 reasonably skilled uh, migrants out of Dubai, India, Philippines, you know, Sri Lanka or whatever to come across and put up as many houses as humanly possible and maybe using these $21,000 uh, uh, units, we'll just get them to uh, knock them together. There is no chance at all of any great easing to let in these migrants from overseas in order to build the houses. And in fact, early this year, when the, must have been, the, I guess, the Auckland Council or government was looking at calling uh, tenders for the city rail loop to be built, and the story came out that one of the Chinese companies looking to bid, and I, I assume they've been doing bidding, um, asked the question, we where can we tie up two cruise ships to house our workers? <laughs> well, within 24 hours, the hammer came down. Every man and his dog in the political spectrum and, and, and saying, uh, no, we, there will not be foreign workers coming in to do this, you know, cheaply, etc. We Kiwis, we still view any big project as a job creation scheme. And that's what the 10,000 affordable homes uh, project is going to morph into. It's going to be tied into trying to get as many people through doing apprenticeships, uh, uh, working on dependency programs, because many will be smoking dope and this sort of thing. You know, it's, it's going to be a mess. And yeah, New Zealand's construction industry is dominated by little players, small companies. Um, and yeah, there's an oligopoly controlling the building materials uh, sector. And uh, maybe it was five or six years ago, um, I wrote a little list, I think it was about eight things, 
and if we were truly serious about addressing housing, mm -hmm. this is what we would do. And I tell you what, the excrement hit the fan because I had mm -hmm. in there one of the proposals, government sets up a state-owned enterprise to deliberately undercut all the building materials companies um, out there and import this stuff from wherever, China or wherever. It's not going to happen. There are many people who will say, this is a job creation scheme for poor, uh, hard-working, or well, not working Kiwis to build these 10,000 homes. Well, you know, I've got a small construction company uh, amongst my various bits and pieces I do because I'm a property developer. And so I do my own civil works. <clears throat> and I can tell you that in the last couple of months, uh, I've had two of my workers show up indiscriminately one, two, three days a week. Mm. I'm so desperate for skilled workers that I put up with it. It's just nonsense. I'm pouring concrete. My guys turn up. And uh, I'm missing one or two guys. And you just suck it up. You just... You just, everybody, all hands to the pump. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I finally sacked these guys, <clears throat> hired their replacement. First day on the job, he doesn't show up. <laughs> he doesn't even text, he doesn't say anything. This is the state of the labour market at the moment. Yeah. So uh, probably a bit of welcomed relief, really. Change of government, take the steam out of things, let everything settle down. And... <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm having a bit of a coughing fit here. Um, you know, a flat period would see asset values being normalised. Incomes will go up. If you have a flat period, rents go up. Mm. What looked previously expensive suddenly becomes more affordable because rents have risen and incomes have risen. And everybody gets used to the values. It takes four or five years. Maybe there's a feel good in the economy. Um, 2020, we have America's Cup. We have APEC, maybe that's the next feel good. Flat period till then, not such a bad thing. Yeah. Let everything catch its breath. Yeah. Ex exactly. Things move in cycles. The cycle was due to end. It ended in Auckland before this government. Um, it had ended with the assistance from the 40% uh, LVR, not really the first goes in October 2013 and October 2015 on the LVRs, 20, 30%, etc. Um, but the cycle was going to pick out anyway. Mm -hmm. And I remember writing from sort of two plus years ago. The cycle definitely peaks out because all the Reserve Bank is doing is finding where is the sweet spot. They found 20% for all buyers, nah, minimum deposit, no. 30% for Auckland investors, no, that's not doing it. Let's try 40% for all investors everywhere. Ah, that's hit the mark. And this is just yeah. like when they raise interest rates. They never know any cycle. How high do we have to take them before we achieve mm -hmm. what we want to achieve? It did bite. It, and, and it definitely, but yeah. for your guide, there is, there's, um, again, ideal in the broad macro space here. Around the world, post the global financial crisis of 2008-09, we've entered an environment where inflation in economies is low. It seems to be staying low. Interest rates are generally staying pretty low and expected to remain low around the world for a long period of time. And central banks are moving their sort of research policy focus sort of away from focusing so much on inflation and interest rates and more towards macro prudential regulation, regulating the banks, making sure they don't do risky lending, getting them ready for whenever the next sort of hit, et cetera, comes along. And banks, because they, um, sorry, central banks, they still need to influence their economies, but if they can't really raise and lower the interest rates all that much sort of any longer, they are moving towards these in instruments of credit control. And so the loan to value ratio was sort of the first <clears throat> tool, extra tool for the Reserve Bank on top of the official cash rate. And they would still like the debt to income ratio, uh, uh, DTI, uh, to in their toolkit, even though they've said that they're not going to be using it um, for quite some time. They don't feel they're going to be needing it uh, uh, at, at all. It's certainly gone off the boiler, but I wouldn't be surprised if they bring back another proposal for it to be implemented. How Labour would respond to that, I, I, I don't know, but it's, it's not something that they'll, they'll be looking to bring in for quite some period of time. And before we get anywhere near there, there'll be an easing cycle in these macro prudential things. Something you mentioned was uh, our exposure to foreign borrowings. But my understanding is that we're down to 29% uh, foreign funds and 71% of bank funding is domestically funded now, which must indicate that we're less vulnerable. Oh, yeah, that's right. Earlier this year, it was 29%. Australia, it get, banks, they get about 25% of their funding for lending in New Zealand. Australia, they get it from overseas. So we're higher than that at 29% earlier uh, this year, but it's still viewed as too high. New Zealand doesn't have a vulnerability in terms of, oh, your banks do bad lending, you're going to get stuffed when a downturn comes along, or, oh, you're building way too many houses, man, they're going to crash in price, and that's going to be uh, the way you're stuffed. It's that... When the GFC came along, 
Lehman Brothers Bank Investment, Investment Bank collapsed in October 2008, we banks could not borrow any new money overseas. Now that's bad enough. We couldn't do new lending because the markets just closed up. Investors just wanted their money beside them in at home. Secondly, money we might have borrowed five years earlier, good long-term borrowing, and let's say in February of 2009, a billion dollars we might have borrowed five years earlier came due for repayment. Normally we'd repay the one billion dollars, you know, bonds, whatever, to the investors, and we'd borrow it back again in another half billion dollars. Uh, 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 when February 2009 would come along, uh, theoretically, uh, we'd pay the billion dollars back and not be able to get to replace it. And so late in the GFC, we're starting to have to think, which of your loans are we going to have to call in to pay back the investors overseas? Now, this is hugely dangerous for New Zealand because we will one day have another environment like that. Now, the 29% was earlier this year. My understanding, I've yet to update my numbers for two months, it's, it's back at about 31% of our uh, borrowing is coming from overseas. Because of the reduction of 30 to 40% in the lending we are now doing to property investors uh, now compared with a year ago, um, there's not so much of a gap between demand for our borrowing and the amount we can finance in New Zealand, but the gap sort of still is there. So a key point I do need to get across to yourselves here. The LVRs have been a source of lending restriction to yourselves as property investors. And we banks, for a variety of reasons, have also imposed our lending restrictions on yourselves as well for your existing portfolios, as well as new borrowings for new properties you want to buy. And of course, there's the new thing on the property developers, you know, the LVRs weren't relevant there, mm -hmm. but there's that new restrictions. Now, this is welcome to the 1970s, where it's not really interest rates that central banks, like our central bank, are using to greatly influence the economy. It's more these credit controls, because that's what went wrong ahead of the global financial crisis. Central banks just didn't have control over where the money was going, how much of it, etc. And so this is a permanent change in the rules, the availability of credit going forward. It doesn't mean we banks won't finance property developments. We're still working uh, with the existing developers. We know them for 40 years. They know us. But here's the biggest irony in New Zealand at the moment. At exactly the same time as the unitary plan in Auckland makes available sufficient intensifiable land to whack up 420,000 houses, not only are the builders not available, the finance isn't available for all of the property developers that are supposed to pop out of the woodwork um, and turn two sections into 22 townhouses. We don't know you, you don't know us. You, as new property developers, probably have no idea what can go wrong in your assumptions about success rate for council inspections, your ability to get concrete poured again if it uh, was raining and you couldn't get it that, that day, you're waiting weeks until you can get poured again. The pricing, the quality uh, of, res of uh, materials, etc. it's a new game. And so this is sort of a, a permanent change in the availability of finance for property development. No proposal from the um, coalition here for provision of finance to property developers. Um, <laughs> so we've seen this before in New Zealand, it's not going too well. <laughs> well, the other thing that I'd like to see is centralised funding for services, because Australia has worked out that if you say to developers, hey, you need a new pipe down the street to connect to, right. we will centrally fund it, you can pay a connection fee, and other, as other people connect, we'll recover uh, the money, including cost of funds, out of the new connections. In New Zealand, the council ridiculously expects the developer to put a hundred thousand dollar pipe down the street, and I've done this this year. Right. And uh, now I'm just getting my developments land banked and stacked yeah. uh, with resource consents, and I'll develop them when the when one of my neighbours goes first. Right. Or somebody in central government says we need to centrally fund this. Right. I'm sure they're going to bring to New Zealand that model. They have to. There, there's something has to be done there. Expanding the boundaries for Auckland, yes, it will have an impact on land prices within outside the boundary, but it doesn't mean anything more is going to get built. It doesn't suddenly yeah, change the uh, the cost of the services. Mm. Look, Tony, thank you very much. That's a fantastic explanation and overview of what's happened. I'm sure that our listeners very much enjoyed that. So I'd like to thank you, and I hope you'll join me again in April, uh, March, April next year when we do our next update with you. Yep. M m most definitely. And I reference those weekly overviews. That's pretty, uh, apart from my fortnightly column in the Property Press, um, that, that's pretty much all the, uh, the only other thing I write. It's on my website. It's a pretty basic website, I can assure you, tonyalexander.co.nz um, to find the weekly overview. And you can click on a link and sign up for the uh, thing there if you want to. So thanks, everybody, for listening. I've enjoyed this session, Matthew. Tony, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you soon.
Appreciate it. And then we'll walk you out. Thank you. Right, everybody, I've got you for another 10 minutes. I just want to run you through a couple of concepts. Uh, if I can get my IT going again. Here we go. So, uh, following that discussion with Tony, I think it's fairly clear we have a flatter market ahead. What now? And I wanted to share with you a couple of things that I've been doing uh, in the last 12 months that I think are going to be flat market proof. But firstly, why would we bother investing in a flat market? Well, I can tell you this year, I've had a lot less competition and I've been getting much better deals. Discounts are now possible. Last year, if you put a low ball offer in, if you said, hey, I'd like to buy this property for 550, it's listed at 650, they'd laugh at you. Now you can put low offers in and uh, the agents are saying things like, well, you know, the law says I must present the offer. It's those, it's those times again where the agents will present tough offers and uh, vendors are actually starting to entertain them. Prices are becoming more negotiable. Certainly that's the Auckland feedback from first six months of this year prior to the election. And I think we're seeing better properties, particularly developable properties, with the lack of finance around for property developments, people are letting them go at bigger discounts. Also ask yourself what's it worth in 10 years? Uh, you know, that is a very, that longer perspective can lead to better quality decisions. You're wondering, oh my goodness, volatility in the market, it's flat for the next few years. Uh, should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? Ask yourself what's it worth in 10 years and when the market's next going up, will you be able to get a deal like that? When you look big picture at how you make money out of property, one way is capital growth, another way is cash flow. Uh, both of those things are gone uh, for the next couple of years. I think we won't see capital growth, particularly with the Labor government uh, dampening inflation, sorry, house price inflation through uh, reducing net migration and uh, the foreign buyers being withdrawn from the market, that, that has to have a dampening effect on capital growth. Even uh, without that, we have the cyclical peak, which is going to naturally dampen house prices. Cash flow is pretty tough to get unless you're using quite targeted strategies. So with those two things gone, why are you investing in property? What I'd say to you is you need to make money on the way in to the property. You need to be either getting a big discount or adding value through renovation or doing something a bit out of the box like perhaps doing a development. Uh, one exception to this I think will be regional investing is still getting the benefit of ripple effect. So if you look at major city prices here which I've had graphed since 2004 uh, and this is indexed to 2007. Uh, you can see that there is a disconnect which I mentioned earlier, it's Auckland lead, Auckland uh, booming much faster than the rest of the country which last couple of cycles that, that effect has been less pronounced, Auckland hasn't had, uh, the booms haven't been quite so Auckland lead although Auckland does go first. So the regions are lack, lagging behind and perhaps there's been some impact of the LVR requirements uh, slowing the regions down just as they were starting to get going but nevertheless you can see the regions off that a better value. So I think that uh, affordability in the regions will draw people out of Auckland and that will continue to underpin the regions even if we see reduced uh, migration. So while I've said Auckland's a fantastic place to invest, maybe it is the region's time next couple of years uh, as I think as Auckland fattens out they're going to continue to get some growth, particularly Wellington and Hamilton would be my picks. Uh, I want to show you an example of instant equity through doing a development. This is a property in Withers Road that I'm doing in a joint venture uh, with a mate of mine. And this is a, a 1450 metre piece of land out in West Auckland. Then I'm going to relocate the existing house. You can see it's unit five on the screen there. And then there are four houses which I'm going to build. Uh, unit one, two, three, four. These are brick and tile houses, nothing flash. Uh, so my mate and I have done the maths on this construction costs will be about 1.5 to relocate the existing house for 100 grand, uh, do the four brick and tiles. Subdivision costs will, will be about 100,000 to title, there's five titles. Construction finance is around 90 grand, three mils cost of completion. In Auckland those five titles are worth circa four million dollars. So there's 970,000 uh, at four million as a valuation and if the valuations are a bit higher that's reasonably conservative. I think if they're a bit higher, we might get 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255, 4.255
which would give us a gross margin of 1.2. So the margin on that site is somewhere between 970 and 1.2. Uh, you can see I've paid 915 uh, for that, and it's a reasonably uh, profitable sort of proposition. Uh, and, and that's the sort of thing that I mean by creating instant equity or adding value when you buy. You go and buy the house from the developer for 845 to 895, there's no growth in it for the next three years. Uh, there's, you know, no cash flow, right? that's for sure. But I'm not paying 845 to 895, I'm buying it at wholesale. You know, $600,000 of title is what I'm paying for it. And uh, I do this in joint ventures, uh, to spread the load makes it a bit easier for me, which is another thing I recommend to clients is look at joint ventures, spread the risk and spread the financial load. And this has uh, uh, really spawned as an opportunity out of the Auckland Unitary Plan, which Tony was mentioning, the rezoning of Auckland to increase the land supply in Auckland. Now what I'd say to you is that you don't have to spend all this money developing a property and have uh, the capacity uh, to raise all that finance in the market, there's another way to make money out of these developable sites, it's called land banking. I want to give you a, uh, an example of a property development, here's just an example, it's actually a property that I'm doing in West Auckland, pretty much, round, round of numbers, but it's pretty much another site of mine in West Auckland. Uh, 1.2 is what we paid for the title, cost of completion is about 3.6 including the land, and uh, the four houses will be about 1.2 each, 4.8. So the gain on the houses is 1.2. Now some of you will have picked up in my numbers a minute ago, where I said it was 970 to 1.2. You should have been saying, what about tax? What about real estate fees? What about GST? That's right, if you sell something, you pay the agent, you pay GST, and you pay income tax. So here 1.2 turns into 600,000 after you pay your two solid partners. Uh, that's the government for taxation and the real estate agent. And net result of all of this is $1.2 million gain becomes 600 after tax, and you've got 600 to pay the agents and the ID. Good income, but big disposal costs. What if you keep them? What if you keep all of these, investment pro these houses as investment properties, so you develop to hold? Well, what you develop to hold becomes non-taxable. There are specific tax exemptions for income tax and GST under current under current tax law that is as old as the hills. You know, New Zealand tax law has not changed on these development rules for a very long time. So if you can afford to build the properties for 3.6 and sit on them, uh, then you, that $1.2 million is non-taxable and no GST, no income tax, no real estate fees. Putting it another way, the 600000 that you haven't spent on agents and taxes is available to fund negative interest for the next 10 years. So if you were 60 grand a year negative cash flow uh, on the 3.6 million after collecting the rents on the four houses you built, uh, then it's pre-funded from the tax and the agent fees that you didn't pay. Then you get the increase uh, on the, the capital gains and so forth for free. So I think that that is a real opportunity in the tax system and it brings together uh, a tax loophole in New Zealand tax and uh, a commercial opportunity of taking advantage of the unitary plan. But let's take it to another level. Actually before I talk about land banking, the example I just showed you, which was the Withers Road example, exactly this situation here, uh, the profits 970 to 1.2, uh, those properties, uh, my JV partner and that and I, We'll do the development together and we will simply rent them out and keep them. By doing that, no tax, no GST, no real estate agent fees, uh, very effective. I, I do have a tax structure which allows one partner to develop and sell and one partner to develop and hold. And uh, it's a very clever joint venture structure, but that's where a good bit of tax structuring together with the commercial opportunity can be flexible and let one side be a developer and the other side be a buy and hold investor and in fact not taint each other, which is a whole different discussion, but if you're interested in that, contact me. Let's talk about land banking, same property. Uh, it's gonna cost you 1.2 million. It's got the same characteristics that you can develop it as I've just shown you, but what if I don't build that property? 
So same maths here, gain on the houses 1.2 million you can see on the screen. Let's say we hold this for 12 years. Let's inflate the cost of building the four houses and the site preparation by 3% compounding. So we're using construction inflation or actually just CPI inflation uh, over 12 years. What would cost you 3.6 to build now will cost you 4.55 to build in 12 years. So you haven't built it, you just wait 12 years and then build it and it costs you 4.55. Now over that time, the cost of inflated uh, at, at the rate of inflation, but the value of the houses which you'll build in 12 years time is what? Well, it's the value that they are today, 4.8 million, times by house price inflation for 12 years. Now in Auckland, that's 11.2% for the last 10 years and higher for the 30 years prior. But let's use 8.5%, let's be a bit more conservative. 12 times 8.5% is 100%, 4.8 goes to 9.6. So what would make you 1.2 million in year one makes you 5 million in year 12. And I call that a slow cook. What makes a great uh, development in year one makes a fabulous development in year 12. This, this is the concept of land banking. You're getting another $3.8 million by waiting. Now, what's the value of that property in 12 years time if you know that the houses that you, are, you can build are worth 9.6 million, but you haven't built them, okay? So you've got the dirty old house that you bought with a big piece of land, you know you can put four houses on it and you haven't built anything. When you first bought it, you knew, you knew there was 1.2 million of margin, but you didn't do it. You just rented it out and suffered terrible negative cash flow for 12 years because land bank assets tend to be negative cash flow. Well, in 12 years time, if you were to value that property, a developer would come in and say, what's it going to cost to build it? And that would be 3.35 inflated over 12 years at 3% compounding from the cost today. So the cost of completion excluding the land is 3.35. The market value is 9.6, so the gross profit in 12 years is 6.2. The developer will want to make some money, let's say 20%, that's 1.25, which the developer is going to pay tax on if the developer does it then. And that leaves 5 mil, so your gain over cost of 1.2 is 3.8. Looking at it another way, what you paid 1.24 is now worth 5 million, Normal houses don't do this, a normal house goes from 1.2 to 2.4, this house has gone from 1.2 to 5 million because what's going up in value is the development potential. Your holding cost is on the original cost, but what is going up in value is a development potential. Now sure you've got to take negative cash flow off that property uh, and it will be worse than normal properties, but you'll still be well ahead if you do the maths. And I think the big picture of this uh, example is 65% of this audience, you've told me, owns one to five properties. If you're going to own one to five properties, they should be these properties if you can afford them. Normal properties going from 1.2 million to 2.4, they make you wealthy. House, properties like this, they make you rich because they just have such massive capital growth. And if you don't understand land banking, you should. The first layer of leverage is bank debt. You know, you, you put a 40% deposit and get growth on 100% because you're getting 60% bank leverage. The second layer of leverage is land banking. And if you're getting the two layers together, you, you just make more. So what I would say to you guys is how many of these do you need to change your future? How are you going to get them? And what are you going to do in this market? Because I meet so many people at different stages of the property cycle and they listen to me and they say, oh, this makes sense you've got the market worked out, that's very clever, and they uh, come to my courses, and they read my books, and they come and consult with me, and somehow, uh, even though they understand it, and they've got the financial capacity to do it, they just wander off and don't do it. And they uh, often come and see me in later years and say, gee, I wish I took your advice 10 years ago when I met you. <laughs> so don't be one of those people. We would invite you to engage with Gilligan Row. What can you do next with us? get on this GRA assistance program. You, what we would say to you is work out where you are now, work out where you're trying to get to, get some knowledge, get a strategy plan, are you going to be a land banker? If you're going to do that, where are you going to do it? It really works a lot better in Auckland. 
uh, what tax structures do you need, what finance do you need, uh, then take action and invest. If you use that path, if you've got better people behind you giving you the right advice, you get a much better outcome. And I think the biggest threat to this is procrastination, thinking about it, studying it, not doing it. Uh, in every environment there's a reason not to do things. Right now the market's going flat. There'll be some great buying in this market. People will misread the market, get fearful, uh, become stressed, and sell things at prices they really shouldn't be selling them for. You need to be alert for it. It's a good environment. Uh, of course, the counterpoint to that is you need your wits about you. Don't don't start paying retail for things that you can't add value to. You need to be making instant equity on the way in. A couple of books to read. Uh, I get a lot of love off Property 101. I get uh, all sorts of people writing to me. I've had uh, three very nice emails this week from people uh, saying that Property 101 has helped them. Uh, it's only 40 bucks. It's available on our website. It's a 500 pages of Property 101. It's a decent research to read. Uh, so pick that up and have a have a read of it if you haven't. And Tax Structures 101, for those of you that haven't done your tax structures, Gilligan Row are uh, uh, top shelf and uh, very clever at doing tax structures. So if you need a hand with that, jump on our website and you can book a free meeting for an initial consultation. Another thing you can do with Gilligan Row is uh, for free, get our articles and blogs. Uh, we read the market. Uh, you know, you'll see in two, 2013, uh, I was running free workshops with Tony Alexander and, and the BNZ, of course, and uh, talking about the unitary plan, which was not due to come in until 2015, that arrived a year later. I was saying, gee, if you go out and buy houses, no one understands the unitary plan. You can get houses so cheap. You can get, you know, 1,000, 1,500-metre sections at Auckland for 400 grand, 500 grand, and, uh, and I was predicting that these things would be a million dollars plus three, four years later, and... That's exactly what's happened. So that's the sort of thing we publish on our web. Uh, we just, it's stream of thought. This is what's happening in the market. This, we, this webinar is a good example of it. We tell you what we think's going on and where the money is. Another thing that we have is uh, free property information evenings at GRA. I run them. Uh, they're in our new market offices. They're quite social uh, because I sort of ad lib it and talk about exactly what's going on in the market and what we've discussed tonight I cover in more detail uh, the strategies you can use to take advantage of the market. So if you haven't been to a, a free property information evening at Gilligan Row, uh, they're um, run monthly and they're in our offices here in Broadway and Newmarket, so you'd be most welcome to attend one of those. Another thing that has become really popular that you may not be aware of, we have a property school. It's the best education in, uh, in the market. It's $450 a week. It's, uh, I'm sorry, it's $450 in total for a seven-week course. And... Uh, People say, why do we give away a A-grade education like that, uh, taken by people that have a lot of skin in the game, myself included. I've got 35 properties in Auckland at the moment. 20 of them are property developments. Uh, why do we do it? Well, we don't make money out of uh, property schools, I can assure you. We make money out of you becoming our clients. It's a sprat to catch the mackerel. So uh, it is, in that regard, very good value. We're betting that if you spend seven weeks with us learning about the best ways to make money out of this market and how to avoid making mistakes and how to take less risk and, and so forth, uh, that you'll engage with us and become clients of our practice. So it's, uh, if you like, a bit of a win-win. You get to know us a bit. You get a whole bunch of knowledge that you would not otherwise have. You get it at a very low price. A lot of the other education companies are charging eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 for the same course. And if you actually examine the uh, net worth of the people doing those courses, uh, you know they don't necessarily have big property portfolios, for example. Whereas in this practice, if you're talking to someone about property, uh, they are deeply in property, borrowing money, setting up trusts, practicing what they preach. And as I like to say to people, if your mentors are doing it, uh, if they can demonstrate that they've made the money doing it, then all you need to do is do what they do and you'll get what they get. Uh, one last thing I'd like to tell you about is Auckland Property Mentors. Uh, it's a, a new joint venture that Gilligan Row has formed with a guy called Tua Sarsevi. I mentioned it earlier, clever, clever guy, Tua Sarsevi, very good property trader and portfolio builder. He's a South Auckland property specialist, and he's also venturing out west with me of a lot of property out in West Auckland. Uh, I think the demographics 
a less volatile and there's a lot of development opportunity out west. So Tour and I are knocking around together these days. And we have a Property Leaders One Day event on the 12th of November in Auckland. It's worth coming to if you're out of Auckland. It's only $25 per head. Uh, and I'm going to be going through the Auckland Unitary Plan and the vesting opportunities that arise uh, from the Auckland Unitary Plan and the development opportunities and the processes and the knowledge that you need to get involved uh, in land banking or development uh, activities in Auckland. Uh, and Tua's going to be going through portfolio building strategies uh, in, in Auckland that work from a cash flow perspective, including trading strategies, rent by the room, uh, and you know just taking advantage of the more cash flow orientated property in South Auckland. It is a bit of a myth that there's no cash flow in Auckland. You can actually get good cash flow in Auckland if you invest in niche strategies and niche areas. If you go and buy an average house, you're not going to get any cash flow. You've got to know where to look and what to do. So the Property School is a seven-week course. It runs 6.30 to 9-ish. It's Auckland only. I'm sorry it's not out of Auckland. We've got no online version of it at the moment. We might do that next year. Uh, we'll teach you property concepts and portfolio building strategies that others don't have because others are not property developers. Uh, well, there are a few developers out there that are fledgling uh, educators, but you want to ask them uh, what they've done <laughs> and see what they're doing. Uh, as I said, I've got 20 developments on the go at the moment. Uh, stop being a retail investor is the main theme here. We want you guys to invest at a wholesale level. If you buy a $600,000 property for $500,000, you get better cash flow. Uh, if the retail value of it's worth 600, you paid 500, and the market falls 10%. Well, the 60 grand that the house price reduces by is margin. It's not cash, and that's the key thing about instant equity in a flat market. You want to lose margin, not cash. So if you're investing in a flat market, you need to be getting in at wholesale. You need to be getting that instant equity. Uh, it's a long time between drinks. It might be years before we see capital growth. There's the price of it, 450 per person. You can bring your spouse or friend for 250 and that's where you can book uh, online on our GRA website. As I mentioned, Property Leaders event on uh, November the 12th, also worth checking out. I uh, hope to see you there. Thank you all very much for listening and staying attentive. I uh, hope you enjoyed our election update and... Thank you for being Gilligan Road clients or uh, attending our events. Thanks and good night.